If you were a kid growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, the moment this logo appeared on screen, you knew you were in for a really fun time. Humongous Entertainment was one of the leading companies in kids' point-and-click adventure games, and along with Play School, Jumpstart, Living Books, and The Learning Company, helped define children's PC games of the time, as well as get a lot of kids hooked on computers and acting as a gateway to the world of PC gaming. Whether it was through fun gameplay with creative problem solving, or having memorable and colorful characters, their games have left their marks on many people's childhoods and are still fondly remembered to this day. So, I thought it would be fun to take a look at the company's history. Now, for this retrospective, I'll be taking a look back at the history of the Big Four Junior Adventure games, as well as Backyard Sports and Moonbase Commander. Oh, not to worry, I will be covering the other games they made during this prologue. So, with all that said, I'm the Media Nutso, and this is the History of Humongous Entertainment. Our story begins back at LucasArts, with two key employees that will play a major role. Programmer and game designer Ron Gilbert, and game producer Shelley Day. At the time, Gilbert was known for working on many of LucasArts' adventure games, including, but not limited to, the first two Monkey Islands and Maniac Mansion, and he also co-designed and coded the game engine that would become the standard for their future adventure games, the script creation utility for Maniac Mansion, or SCUM for short. Meanwhile, Day was the producer behind such games as Monkey Island 2, Test Drive, which later became the Need for Speed series, and Robot Rascals. One day, they were watching a four-year-old boy, who was one of Shelley Day's sons, playing Monkey Island, and noticed that, though he couldn't read any of the dialogue, he was having a lot of fun just poking around, solving random puzzles, and opening and closing random doors. Following that, Day and Gilbert lamented the fact that there weren't any adventure games being made specifically for kids. Thus, they decided to resign from LucasArts, along with a few other key employees, and after assembling a Cracker Jack team together, in March of 1992, they went on to found their own company in Woodenville, Washington, Humongous Entertainment, which they credit ex-LucasArts colleague Tim Schaefer for suggesting the name. Dave would serve as the CEO and President, while Gilbert would be the Creative Director. Also, going with that name was a conscious choice on their part, as they wanted to be thought of more as an entertainment company rather than an educational one. Plus, it was vague enough that it would allow them to branch off into other forms of entertainment. In fact, the original plan was to start off by doing kids games, then quickly move into doing adult games, and eventually venture outside doing PC games. Considering how well the games they made turned out, they most certainly could have achieved the latter too. Also, Ron Gilbert made a deal with LucasArts where he would continue to work and develop the Scum Engine, but any changes made would revert back to LucasArts. However, in exchange, Humongous would get the license to use the engine for their games. When developing said games, the goal Day, Gilbert, and the crew had in mind was not to create educational games, but rather bring their own children's stories to life. Sure, they had some educational elements in there, but the main goal was to emphasize the entertainment aspect, since the other big kids game companies tended to focus more on the educational part. They also applied what was referred to as the principles of adventure games that they learned from their tenure at LucasArts, where, though the games were aimed at kids, they didn't dumb down the plot or the gameplay. They wanted them to have some level of intelligence and required the players to remember and strategize, like when they pick up an item that they may need to use later on. Great! 
We found a wrench. Whoa! We did it! The fruits of the team's labor will come to fruition with the release of their first game, Putt-Putt Joins the Parade for the MS-DOS, Mac, and most surprising of all, the 3DO. The end result worked out pretty well in their favor, as critics gave the game some good reviews and it sold very well in its first year. It was a good start for the company, but shockingly and surprisingly, it almost ended up being their only game released. Why? You see, they had gotten Electronic Arts, and yes, I am talking about THAT Electronic Arts, to give them $300,000 to help get their company off the ground and to distribute their games on the then newly released 3DO. But this got them into legal trouble with LucasArts, who sued them over violating their licensing agreement of the Scum Engine. Luckily for them, the court ended up settling in Humongous' favor and they were allowed to continue forward with their operations. A year later, they came up with not just Putt-Putt's second adventure, Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon, but also Putt-Putt's Fun Pack, and earlier that year, a second adventure game, Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise, starring a new character named, well, Fatty Bear, who was based on a real stuffed bear owned by the friend of the character's creator, Laurie Bauman Arnold. The plot of it is very simple. Fatty Bear and the other toys decide to throw a surprise party for their owner, Kayla, while she's sleeping. So, they have to get the room decorated and bake the birthday cake before Kayla wakes up. But, it isn't that easy and straightforward, especially with a few of the items scattered about and Kayla's new puppy getting loose and Fatty having to catch her and get her back to the kitchen before she causes any more trouble. So, did this one turn out as well as Putt-Putt? Eh, not really. When it hit the shelves on March 26, 1993, the game sold decently and critics gave it good reviews. But it wasn't quite as popular as Putt-Putt was. In fact, one review, though overall positive, stated that if given the choice, players should take Putt-Putt over Fatty Bear. The only other game the character got was his own fun pack, which was later bundled together with Putt-Putt's and re-released in 1994 as Putt-Putt and Fatty Bear's Activity Pack, which also made it the last game Humongous released on the MS-DOS. The game doesn't have a lot in the way of unused elements, but it does have a couple of music cues exclusive to the 3DO version, like a rendition of Funeral March of a Marionette, which was also used in the demo, and a longer variation of another track. actual unused piece is a dialogue clip from the Veggie Head minigame. No clear reason was given as to why it was cut, but it's likely that there were concerns that some people might mishear it as something else. Dear me, I am a sight. So, with all that being said, why didn't Fatty Bear receive another adventure game? Well, in addition to not being as popular, Supposedly, Humongous would have had to pay royalties to the original owner if they wanted to use him for future games, which the company wasn't willing to do. So, Fatty Bear was reduced to just getting background cameos in some of the later games. In 1994, Humongous Entertainment would see some significant changes, beginning with making the leap from the MS-DOS to the more advanced Windows 95, which would be reflected with the release of their second junior adventure series, Freddy Fish, which also marked quite a jump in visual quality and presentation. Where the previous games utilized the pixelated graphics of the MS-DOS, Freddy Fish would mark as their first game to use fully hand-drawn animation, 
which would become the main standard for many of their other games to come, and was also the first to implement interchangeable game paths, which also became a big mainstay. Every time the game boots up, it randomizes which path the player is going to get, so no one player gets the same path each time. The next year saw not only the release of the third Putt-Putt game, and the first one made specifically for Windows, Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo, but they also re-released the MS-DOS games on the system, and they collaborated with Random House to create a trilogy series called The Junior Field Trips, with Let's Explore the Farm and the Airport both released on July 11th, and Let's Explore the Jungle on November 14th of that year. Hosted by a new character, Buzzy the Knowledge Bug, he takes players on tours of, well, a farm, an airport, and the three different types of jungles in the world, while also breaking down how everything in each place functions. Now, an interesting trivia note about Let's Explore the Farm. It was actually first released on November 22nd, 1994, and the series was originally called The Junior Encyclopedias, and as shown here, the graphics look much rougher compared to the later entries. It was later updated to be more in line with the other two, though the overall look remained intact. I guess Encyclopedia would have sounded too boring to the intended audience. Also, in Let's Explore the Airport, there are four scenes that didn't make it into the finished version, which include... Now that's a lot of gas! Excuse me. Now that's a lot of gas. Gee, gads, I'm late. The wife will have my head on a platter for this. What'll I do? Warning! Do not try this at home. Rabbit Pay having their ears pulled. Hey there, partner. That's going to be about uh, five bills for that parking deal there. Are you waiting for something, man? <laughs> There's also some music from both Fatty Bear and Putt Putt Joins the Parade that were left over and were probably meant to play in the waiting room, and a couple of unused sounds. Some chatter that was probably meant for, again, the waiting room, and a bit for the radio where one would hear excerpts of various clip points and a bit of the unused song from the first Freddy Fish. Mm. <laughs> 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 Lastly, there's a level editor for the Lost Luggage minigame. As for Let's Explore the Jungle, it only has the full version of the bonus level music, and a line of code that'll add an on-screen message telling what size font the game is currently using. Yeah, this one was pretty pointless. So, how come the Junior Field Trips never got any more entries? Two reasons. The three games were neither critical nor commercially successful, and because the crew weren't as invested in them as they were with the Junior Adventures. During that same year, Shelley Day and Ron Gilbert established a new subdivision called Cave Dog Entertainment, which would allow them to develop games of varying genres aimed at a much older audience, their most well-known one being the critical and commercial hit, Total Annihilation. Unfortunately, it and a reskin of it, Total Annihilation Kingdoms, would be their only games released, as the division ended up dissolving in 2000. In 1996, Humongous released their third junior adventure series, Pajama Sam, and also came up with a new spin-off line called The Junior Arcades, which were essentially their takes on different arcade games. Like Balloonorama was doing Breakout, Sockworks adapted the Lost Luggage minigame from Let's Explore the Airport, Dog on a Stick was basically Cubert, 
Maze Madness and Lost and Found were collectathons, and the last three were various side scrolling shooters. The reason they were made was twofold because the crew really enjoyed creating them, and they allowed the company to put out more games in a single year. Released from November of 96 to September of 2000, they would have two compilation discs dubbed the Super Duper Arcades. But here's a bit of trivia. Both Sockworks and Hold the Mustard would have some connections to a couple of the later adventure games. Plus, the latter has the distinction of being the only one to be first released as part of a compilation disc, Super Duper Arcade 2, before receiving an individual release. Also, in the city levels of Lost and Found, if you look real carefully in the background, one of the buildings is actually Humongous' office headquarters, and the city itself is Sam's hometown. Most of them don't have much in the way of unused elements. Just a few examples. In Maze Madness, there's an early build of the minigame Squoosh that will later be seen in Puppa Travels Through Time. Sockworks has a bad level that the player will be redirected to if it fails to load up a level. Uh oh, something's wrong. The Sockomatic only sets itself up like this when it can't read its instructions from the CD. The CD might be dirty or even scratched. I think you better quit the game and try cleaning the CD and an unused one that'll never get selected to appear. Lost and Found has four unused music loops. some funky music that plays if funky is input as the passcode. <music> Typing in crazy will cause all the background and item layers to shift around. Putting in bonus or ended will take the player to the bonus games and the enemy respectively. An early design of the toll booth enemy that may or may not resemble a developer and in Hold the Mustard, it has a weird unused music cue identical to the song The Napoleon Complex. However, out of all of them, Dog on a Stick has the most unused graphics of any of the junior arcades, including unused level themes, like one for space and a kitchen themed one, a variant of the penguin enemy with a summer outfit, a very weird skunk-esque iteration of Pep Sprite from Balloonorama, some holder animation for the presence in the bonus levels, an early version of the customs level button, and unused enemies. There's also some joke credits that were just meant as a placeholder, but it does give some details on its early development stages, like the game was first called Pogo Dog, and they also slipped in some not-so-subtle jabs to Rep Mathis and the other team that were working on some of the other Junior Arcade games, and the superimposed heads shown are game designer Matt Mayen, lead artist Tom Berry, and programmer and level designer Dolores Carney. Oh, and one more tidbit. These games predated Super Mario Maker by being the earliest games to allow players to custom make and play their own levels. They were truly ahead of the curve with these ones. Anywho, in that same year, they'd go through a major changeup. On July 11th, Humongous Entertainment was purchased by GT Interactive for $76 million. At the time, this was good for them, as this gave the company some needed financial support, and what further bolstered it was that GT left Humongous alone, and allowed them to continue doing operations their way. 1997 would be another big year, with Humongous coming up with three new series. 
One was a spy genre spoof that would become their fourth junior adventure series, and the oldest skewing, Spy Fox. The second would be the first in a series of junior sports games that would later become its own big series, Backyard Baseball. And the last was a younger skewing educational duology called Big Thinkers, with Kindergarten and First Grade both released on October 22nd. The best way to describe the tube would be, imagine a much trippier version of Jumpstart, but with two very enthusiastic childlike teenagers that can morph into just about anything. And they are the most educational games Humongous ever made more so than the junior field trips. The gameplay of both is very simple. Players solve various puzzles or play minigames and be rewarded with smart stars for their efforts. The higher the difficulty, the more they earn. Once they've collected enough of them, they can take on the Superstar Smarts Challenge and play it as many times as they want. How many jars of mustard would equal my height now? Start by moving that food item next to me. We've got lots of stuff for sale today. Click on your coins until they add up to the price of what you want to buy. These two really don't have a lot of unused elements. Now, as previously stated, they only came up with just the kindergarten and first grade editions. But that wasn't originally the plan. There was a third game, the second grade edition, being developed and would have been released the following year. But it was cancelled as it was too ambitious for one team to develop three games at once. Not helping either that the two games didn't sell very well and critics gave them some mixed reviews. At the same time, they had struck a deal with Lancet Media Entertainment to adapt their games into animated television shows that were to premiere on PBS in the fall of 1998. You probably remember Lancet as being the production company behind the classic series Reading Rainbow. Oh, but that's not all. They also planned on making videos and even movies. But for whatever reason, those plans, along with the shows, ended up falling through. Ashamed, really, as they could have easily made for some great and entertaining shows. Though, from what was said about the Plan Pajama Sam series, it was a good thing that version didn't make it to air. On a side note, many of the games released that year were dedicated to programmer Brett Barrett, who unfortunately passed away the year prior. Anyways, the next year, the company really struck it big when they teamed up with Nickelodeon to develop and release six Blue's Clues games, released between 1998 and 2000. Though Infogrons would later come out with two more in 2002. The games were highly praised for faithfully translating the show to the games. In fact, two of them were adapted from two episodes. Unfortunately, due to licensing issues, they may never see any kind of reissue on current platforms. But physical copies are easy to find online and are pretty cheap. By November of 1999, there would be another big company buyout. But this one would spell the beginning of the end for Humongous Entertainment. Amidst a lot of financial difficulties, GT Interactive was acquired by the French-based Infogrames and would be renamed Infogrames Inc. At first, it didn't seem too bad as in 2000, Humongous released a set of activity center games called the One Stop Fun Shop for all of the junior adventures, except for Spy Fox. In them, one can make various cards, party decorations, paper hats, and even have special stories unique to each that one can color in. But now, this is where the story starts to get a bit more complicated. By February of 2000, Ron Gilbert had grown very frustrated with all of Infogrom's executive interference and resistance to creating new intellectual properties. 
which was perfectly exemplified with what was going to be their first ever pre-rendered CGI adventure game, A Gas Pocket Adventure, Aliens Ate My Cookies. So, he and Shelly Day announced their plans to buy back the company from Infogroms, and for Humongous to become independent once again. To which, they got the blessing of Infogroms CEO, Bruno Bonnell, to do it. Less than a month later, they had everything ready to go. But the day of the purchase was unfortunately both at a very bad and ironic time because it was on the same day as when the dot-com bubble burst, where many big internet-based companies in the tech industry were hemorrhaging money really fast. As a result, all of their funding got pulled, and in the early spring, they ultimately made the hard decision to resign from their positions at the company. And I do mean hard. The day they announced it, Ron Gilbert stayed virtually silent about it, while Shelly Day was in sorrow. Honestly, who could blame them? After all, Humongous was their baby, and they were essentially being forced to give it up. From there, they, along with 20 other key employees, and frequent outside writer and collaborator Dave Grossman, went on to found a new game company, Hulabi Entertainment, in 2001. They made a distribution deal with Disney to have their games published and released under the new division of Disney Interactive, Plaid Banana Entertainment. Unfortunately, the company didn't last very long. Why? Well, in March of 2003, Shelly Day got into some heated legal trouble for committing bank fraud due to forging bank statements. And not long after that, in July, Ron Gilbert had resigned as well though he didn't specify why. In the end, Who Would Be only came out with six games, their most notable ones being Moopin' Dreadly and the Treasure on Bing Bong Island, and Olo and the Sunny Valley Fair. The rest were tie-ins to a couple of Disney and Pixar films, and Cocoa Puffs. Though the company would try to go on by making some casual games like Mahjong Jr., without the right financing and talent, it just didn't work out. Thus, Hulabi shut down their operations in 2005. Anyways, back at Humongous, things had truly started taking a turn for the worse. On June 13, 2001, Infogrons laid off 82 employees, or about 40% of their staff, which really plummeted company morale and employee confidence across the board. However, the troubles don't stop there. When they had a new game in production, Moonbase Commander, Infogrames had so little faith in it, they didn't give it the right kind of promotion, and even went as far as to not give it an E3 presentation, resulting in almost no one knowing about it, and the game ended up as a big failure when it hit shelves in late summer of 2002. Man, that is just icy. Now, backing up a bit to 2000, Infogrames had purchased Hasbro Interactive, who at the time owned the rights to the Atari brand, and on May 7, 2003, they decided to rename Infogrames Inc. to Atari Inc. Later that year, Humongous released two more junior adventure games, Pup Pup Pep's Birthday Surprise, and Pajama Sam and Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff, respectively. The big difference with these two compared to the others is that, where the previous games utilized the Scum engine, these two, along with the current Backyard Sports games at the time, used a new game engine dubbed the Yaga engine, and were also produced on smaller budgets. It really shows. Suffice to say, while critics gave them good reviews, fans on the other hand have called them the worst of their respective series and they both ended up as flops, thus putting a sad end to the Junior Adventure line. After that, they continued to limp along with more backyard sports games until August of 2005, when the company was sold to the majority stockholder Infogrames SA for $10.3 million, 
on the condition that all titles that Humongous had developed be released through March 31st, 2006. Of which, they didn't have any. And the day after that, the company had officially dissolved. The last official game Humongous ever made was Backyard Football 2006. This was certainly a sad day for both the remaining crew members and longtime fans to see the company they loved so much come to such an unceremonious end. After that, Infogrames transitioned all of the assets and brands to a new company, Humongous Inc. Yeah, real original! Now, no longer bound by any of the agreements of Atari Inc., they would go on to re-release some of the games along with Majesco Entertainment. Speaking of Majesco, in 2008, they attempted to port over the first installment of each Junior Adventure series, Sans Putt-Putt, over to the Wii, by subcontracting the job out to Mystic Software, who in turn gave it to their Ukrainian post, Mystic Soft. And how did those turn out? Pretty bad because they would get them into a lot of legal trouble. How so? Well, instead of properly porting the games, the Mystic Soft crew just put in a scum VM build without permission, thus violating their general publishing license and failing to give credit to the scum VM team, resulting in the latter to file a lawsuit against the company. It didn't help either that the ports themselves were heavily rushed to meet deadlines and had very little care given to them. And it really shows. They run on slow machine mode for some reason, play at a faster rate than normal as well as pitching up the audio, and having a lot of glitches. It says to find Grandma Grouper's treasure chest, go to the volcano. I'm gonna be rich when I find that treasure. Needless to say, it didn't work out well, and the Wii port releases ended up getting pulled from store shelves, thus ending their short-lived Wii port attempt. There were a few other attempts to revive them, like with Freddy Fish ABC Under the Sea for the Nintendo DS, which was released in 2008 in Europe, then in America two years later. Unfortunately, it would get criticized by longtime fans for just being a purely educational title instead of being an adventure game, its very simplistic gameplay, and for not having the same spirit of the main series. And the game would become a failure. This in turn discouraged Atari Inc. from making any more attempts to revive the adventure games on new consoles. So is this where Humongous Entertainment's story ends? Nope, not even close. In fact, it would actually get a little better from here. In 2009, amidst a difficult financial situation, Infogrames SA, who by then had been renamed Atari SA, filed bankruptcy for three American subsidiaries, Atari Inc., Atari Interactive, and of course, Humongous Inc. Hence, on July 19th, 2013, as part of the resolution proceedings, the Humongous brand, along with most of its assets, were sold off to Tomo Inc., while the Backyard Sports series was acquired by the Evergreen Group, and Moonbase Commander was purchased by Rebellion Developments. Now with the trademark on their hands, Tomo decided to relaunch the Humongous Entertainment website in January of 2014, and in collaboration with Night Dive Studios, they went on to digitally re-release many of their games on the digital distribution service Steam between April of 2014 and August of 2015, exactly nine years after the original company had dissolved. They've also been released on Android, the App Store, and the iOS. Most recently, they've been released on the Nintendo Switch. Though Tomo hasn't been doing much with the company recently, aside from special promotions and sales happening, they did help in bringing the games back for a whole new generation. However, before all of that, there was a brief period where the games were released on Android and iOS by Nimbus Games. And the very first one they put out? Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo. 
it was also released on Big Fish Games. Also, in 2013, Nimbus Games came out with Freddy Fish's and Putt Putt's Funhouse, which were puzzle activity games themed to their respective series. That's about all they were. As you can see, as I said at the start, nearly 30 years after their initial releases, Humongous Entertainment's games have left their impact with both kids and adults, mainly those that grew up playing them, thanks to their strong writing, characters, and humor that even parents can appreciate. So much so, in fact, that Ron Gilbert stated that when the kids went off to bed, their parents would be sneaking off to play them as a guilty pleasure. Over its lifetime, Humongous had sold over 15 million units combined, and their critical success wouldn't go unnoticed, as they would win over 400 awards of excellence. The crew set out to make entertaining games and tell their own children's stories, and they didn't just achieve it, they exceeded them in the best way possible. They've become the kind of games that just make you feel good replaying them, and knowing the thought and care the crew put in when making them, it makes them just that much more special when revisiting them. And now, we begin our journey into each of the five big series, starting off with the friendliest and most helpful purple convertible you'll ever meet. When Humongous Entertainment first opened for business in March of 1992, they were ready to get their feet wet in the adventure game market. But what would their first ever game be about? It'd have to be one that both epitomized who they were as a company and their main mission statement. I got it! How about a talking car? Then what you'd get is their first junior adventure series, Putt Putt. The series centers on Putt Putt, a young purple convertible living in his home of Car Town. Along with his dog Pep, they go off on various adventures, whether it's preparing for a big race, helping rescue baby animals, or even traveling through time to the past or the future. Through it all, Putt Putt does whatever he needs to accomplish every goal, but also selflessly helps out others with their problems. He's just that good of a guy. It all started in the mind of Humongous's CEO and President, Shelly Day, who first originated the character as a series of bedtime stories she would tell to her child, Travis. The first one she thought up was one about Putt Putt saving a cat caught up in a tree. This of course would lay out the groundwork for the series world and its characters. When it comes to developing the actual adventures, the first thing the team does is toss around some ideas until they come across one in particular that caught their eyes. From there, they put together the game's story and create the necessary environments needed for each game. For the characters themselves, they have to consider what their personalities are, their individual characteristics, what their roles and purposes are, and most importantly, what kind of vehicles they should be. Once they've settled all that out, they next turn their focus onto their overall look and design, then experiment with different color schemes before settling on the final look. After that, the crew moves on to storyboarding each scene of the game and checking to make sure they transition correctly, then move on to doing the backgrounds, recording all of the voices, making the animation, which many of their games, except for the MS-DOS ones, used around 30,000 individual drawings, and from there, they have a whole team dedicated to coloring the frames and animating all the clip points. When all that's complete, it's then handed off to the programmers who write in the codes that make the games respond to whatever the player selects. From there, it's sent off to the sound effects programmer to, well, program all the sound effects in, and last but certainly not least, they bring on the composer to make the game's musical score. 
Now, like a lot of other games, not everything the crew did ended up in the finished version. Some aspects or elements were cut out for one reason or another, so I'll attempt to bring up some of the more interesting and notable bits. So, now that we got all that out of the way, let's take a drive into Car Town and join Peppa on his adventures. Starting off with Peppa joins the parade, Peppa wants to participate in the annual Car Town Pet Parade. But before he can, he first needs to do three tasks. Get a car wash, or switch it out with a new paint job. So you'll need to earn some money. But how? You could mow some lawns. But I don't have a lawn more. Here, borrow mine. <laughs> Gee, thanks. How else can I earn money, Smokey? Well, you can also deliver groceries for Mr. Baldini. Those are great ideas. A balloon and a pet. More specifically, he wants a puppy. So, Papa travels around Car Town and does what he needs in order to join the parade. It's about as simple and straightforward as it sounds. As far as being both Humongous' first game and the first in the series overall, it's a nice start. The game is very cute, sweet, and charming. It does a good job at setting up pup world, how it functions, what the player is supposed to do, and where they're supposed to go. It's a very simple slice of life plot, with pup needing to do a few things before he can join the parade. But for this sort of game, that's all it needs to be. After all, it's meant to be like a kid's bedtime story. Plus, that doesn't stop it from being somewhat relatable. I mean, who hasn't wanted to participate in a fun big event like a parade? Also, it does have some good bits of humor sprinkled in, like this bit. How can we march without any music? I think I can help you. Uh, beep, beep yourself. The gameplay itself is fairly simple, as it only follows one linear game path but the player can change up the order they do things, like getting Papa a car wash first, then a new paint job before going to find his puppy. The only elements that are randomized are the street you go to first to mow lawns, and the shape and color of Baby Beep. In fact, you'll see that many of the games follow this formula. As for the backgrounds, character designs, and animation, they do look quite good, especially for the Amistos at the time, though they do look off in some angles. Speaking of the characters, they are charming, fun, and colorful, although some of them are pretty one-note. The game also has plenty of little mini-games, like the puzzle block, joke telling, mowing, pinball, and a Where's Waldo one with Finding Baby Beep. All told, you have a very simple but fun game, and as stated before, a good start for the company. Now, for those of you who have played many of the games, you've no doubt noticed that many of the early ones don't have any lip syncing. Top of the morning, you dear Pot Pot. What can I help you with today? I need to find a balloon to take to the parade. Why is this? Well, there are two reasons. One was, of course, to save on a lot of time and money, as the game had a short production cycle and was made on a small budget of $125,000. The second is because it was made during a transitional period. You see, up until this point, a lot of PC games had all of the dialogue presented in text due to the limitations of the computers at the time. Starting in the early 90s, they were beginning to slowly transition to having the dialogue recorded. Think like when movies moved from silent to sound. However, it proved to be both exciting and very challenging. Keep in mind, the game was being made for the MS-DOS, which had a limited capacity and low resolution, even for the time. So the team had to work within the system's limitations. Also, the crew felt adding lip-syncing to a CD-ROM game was a technical feat they didn't need to conquer. Plus, it looked better and more appealing to watch random mouth movements. Heck, 
even after the games jumped over to Windows 95, they never really had true lip syncing. Instead, what they did was add and change some of the mouth positions that were used based on what a character is saying in the moment, and oftentimes would hold on to a specific mouth position, like when a character goes, oh, so that their mouths don't end up flapping all about. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that they use four or five different animated lip movements and then sync them up with the dialogue. Hence why it looks like an anime dub straight out of the 1980s. The game doesn't have a whole lot of unused graphics or dialogue, but it does have some music tracks that were used in the 3DO version, like one meant for the car wash, one for the monkey band in the toy store window, A mini rendition, also used on the Mac, that plays when the jack-in-the-box in the toy store is clicked. And, on the floppy disk version, the joke telling minigame and puzzle block were supplanted by the box o box clip point that cycles through different animations. When Pup Pup first came out of the garage on November 6, 1992, he made a good first impression for himself. Critics gave the game good reviews for its gameplay, title character, and its appeal to kids. As for the game sales, it did quite well, selling between 65 and 75,000 units in its first year, making it Humongous Entertainment's first big hit. Later on, the game would end up selling a lifetime total of 300,000 units. So, with a big success on their hands, Humongous would naturally make a sequel. The next year would see Puppa taking a trip outside Cartown and the planet, and Puppa goes to the moon. In this, Puppa and Pep visit the fireworks factory run by his friend Mr. Firebird, who gives him a tour of the place and they all have a swell time. Oh wait, did I say they have a swell time? What I meant to say was, a large sky rocket gets accidentally launched, sending Papa and Pep into outer space, and they end up landing on the moon. Because that's a regular occurrence that happens at any normal fireworks factory. Once there, he makes friends with a lunar rover named, well, Rover. In order to get back home, they need to buy a rocket ship, but it's missing a few parts and it needs fuel. So, Puppa has to traverse across the moonscape, retrieving the needed items so he, Pep, and Rover can return back home to Earth. Boy, talk about stepping up the level in nearly every aspect! The team did an admirable job expanding Puppa's world and stepping up the adventure aspect. While the first one was more of a slice of life story, and had more of a, pardon the pun, down to earth tone, this one definitely felt more like the kind of adventures they'd later do in the other series. Sure, the way the story is kicked off is pretty crazy, but once they get to the moon, it becomes the classic getting home plotline, with the added spin of needing to get back from the moon and fixing up a rocket in order to do so. One nice touch added was having Rover, Putt Putt, and Pep working together to get the steering wheel. Speaking of Rover, his backstory and flashback is interesting as it's notable for being the only time humans are ever seen in the Putt Putt universe. The name's Rover, and I got quite a story to tell. I was brought here from Earth by some astronauts, but when they went home, I was left behind. That's too bad. There's also one nice bit of meta humor, where one lyric in the theme song pokes fun at the fact that Pup Pup Sprite is always smiling, even when faced in a bad situation. We're glad that you're happy, but 
what I'd like it not be. The gameplay once again has the player follow a single path, and having Papa gather up the five needed rocket components. But it randomizes things up more than the first game did, like which key you need and the apartment force you have to go to. Not to mention, the puzzles in this require more creative problem solving and memorizing. The backgrounds do a great job at capturing the look and atmosphere of the moon's surface, and the team really got creative with the locations the player goes to and the variety of designs for the aliens. Which brings us to them. The new characters here have more personalities than the ones in the first game did, with Mr. Firebird and Rover being particular standouts, with the former's eccentric voice that's emulating Pee Wee Herman, and the latter's aforementioned backstory. Of course, it's also got plenty of fun minigames, including Bear Storming featuring Fatty Bear, Alien Tag, The Observatory, Simon, and The Moon Maze. One noteworthy aspect about the game is, this is the first humongous game to have music scored by George Allister, the Fat Man Sanger, who would go on to be one of the company's mainstay composers for several of their games. So, with all of that, you've got yourself a very solid follow-up. Now, before I get into the next section, I want to briefly talk about the game's demo. What's so special about it? Well, it's the only one to have a puzzle not found in the actual game. No other demo they made before or after it had an exclusive puzzle in it. Like the last game, not a lot of unused elements in this one, but once again, there are plenty of unused music cues unique to each version, including 7 of them on the 3DO, One from the DOS version, which was intended to play when Papa touches down on the moon. And a different instrumental version of the title music. Lastly, there's one notable bit of unused dialogue that didn't make it into the final game, and that was a radio newscast talking about, and I'm not joking about this, a criminal suit being filed against Mr. Firebird. A criminal suit was filed against Mr. Firebird. He is accused of purposeful wrongdoing and criminal neglect. It is believed that Mr. Firebird's negligence caused Putt-Putt's unfortunate accident earlier today. This was intended as an in-joke by the developers, so it wasn't really meant to play in the finished version. Besides, it would have painted Mr. Firebird a lot more as a villain had it remained in. 
When Pup Pup, Pep, and Rover blasted off from the moon on October 1st, 1993, they perfectly touched down on Earth. Critics gave it great praise, even more than joins the parade, saying that they liked how it challenged kids' problem-solving skills. And since Pup Pup joins the parade was already a sales success, it's safe to say that Ghost to the Moon went on to be another big hit. Jumping ahead two years later, Putt-Putt is off to set up the next big car town event in Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo. On the day of the grand opening of the car town zoo, Putt-Putt volunteers to deliver Zoo Chow to the new zookeeper Outback Owl. When he gets there though, he soon learns that things are in a bit of a mess, with a raised river dam, damaged rafts, a stuck open drawbridge, and the worst of all, six baby animals have gone missing. Now, Putt-Putt has to help rescue the animals and get them back home to their families before the zoo can open. How in the world Outback Out let all of that happen prior to opening day is anyone's guess. Now, it may be a step back from going to the moon, but that doesn't stop it from being a fun game. The story this time is more of a day in a life scenario, with helping to fix a soon to open zoo and the added spin of needing to rescue some baby animals. And once again, it's pretty straightforward. Putt Putt has to help each baby animal out of their specific predicaments, but it does vary up how they're stuck and it does play around with the areas of the zoo and the animals living in it. Plus. It has a good amount of self-referential and meta bits. In advertising tie-in. You literary creatures were very pleased to meet you. I haven't written this verse yet. But uh, I will write it and it will sound much better than when we had a wet wet wet. Like the other two, the gameplay follows just a single game path where the player goes around the zoo getting the items necessary to help each baby animal out of their specific predicament. And once more, players can change up the order they rescue them or go talk to the parents before going to find them. There's also some fun side sections, like shooting the rapids, taking a photo safari, playing animal tag, and of course, ice hockey. The backgrounds and the overall look of the zoo is very vibrant, detailed and colorful, and they do a great job of making each area look and feel huge. And as the first pup up game for Windows 95, the team did a great job transitioning the characters to hand-drawn, as it introduced pup ups more recognizable design and the character animation is much smoother and bouncier than before, though some of the designs can be somewhat off-putting. Also, it doesn't shy away from throwing in a few easter eggs. The new characters featured have some colorful, fun, and bold personalities, with some even having some outside influences, like Outback Al was clearly inspired by the late Steve Irwin. Oh, and for anybody who's thinking it, no, the inclusion of lions here was no way influenced by the Lion King. While it's likely the crew was aware of the film, I mean, who wasn't at the time, they weren't exactly going out of their way to reference it. So it's nothing more than a big coincidence. Now, the game isn't entirely flawless. For one, as this was the first Puppa game fully animated and hand-drawn, there are many times where the characters would go off model in certain scenes. One example in particular being with Baby Jumbo during his encounter with the giant mouse, as he would constantly change positions in different shots. Now, this was because the animators had to properly composite him in. Another one would be that, unlike the previous game, this one doesn't have as many randomized items. Apart from the wrench shape switching out and the usual staple of changing Pup Putt's color, not much else gets randomized. But even with those setbacks, this is still another solid entry in the series. Now, a couple of trivia notes. The crew inserted the cow into almost every game as a nod and throwback to joins the parade, 
which goes to show just how much care and respect the crew behind the games have for them. Also, you know the bit where Putt-Putt's first talking to Outback Al through the intercom? Hello, Outback Al? It's me, Putt-Putt. I'm here to deliver some zoo chow. The way they achieved the effect was by recording Bob Zank speaking through a walkie-talkie. They could have just done the normal process of placing a filter over the voice, but it's great to see they went the extra mile for authenticity. Also, in the calm part of the rapids, the music you used in it, Echoes in the Jungle, sounds a lot like a nod to doing banjos. That was fun! Now, unlike the first two games, this one has a lot of unused elements. For starters, there are some hidden cutscenes and unused jokes, including... They're moving in herds. They do move in herds. I got a joke. Want to hear it? You bet I do. <laughs> Have I ever told you the moose joke? The moose joke? Oh, you gotta tell me. I'll have some cotton candy, please. On the double. Here you are. Hey. It also has some interesting unused graphics. Like the penguin section originally had its own fat kiosk and even had animation done for it. But it was ultimately removed from the final game. And it was a fairly late change too, as all that was done to hide the kiosk was overlay another graphic over it. But one can still see its shadow, and it can be seen in the save load pictures. Next, there are storyboard sketches for a clip point involving the monkey getting knocked off the vine by another monkey and narrowly escaping the alligator. Then, there's a wild developer's joke with what looks like Bigfoot whacking someone to the ground being seen through the telescope. It's a fairly old leftover as it uses a different image format compared to the other telescope images. Also, there's this picture of Mr. Baldini. Now, in the original release, it wasn't possible to take his picture since, unless he was talking to Putt-Putt, He's always inside his store, and using the camera on the door does nothing. But this was remedied in the 1999 re-release. Lastly, there's this image for, of all things, Putt-Putt's driver's license. It can only be seen as the second to last image in the credits when one adds in this line of code. Now, what would this game be without having some unused audio? Firstly, there's some unused music tracks, like a generic Jungle Land drum beat track. Another generic track with no actual placement. an instrumental version of the Rhyming Gibbons backing track. An extended melodyless rendition of one of the Arctic Land themes. and a penguin bop beat that doesn't play. There are also five unused given rhymes that, like the driver's license, can be enabled by putting in a code, which in this case is this. How about fatty? Fatty? <laughs> 
okay, okay. I saw a fatty. I think it was your daddy. Uh, oh, yeah. Come on, come on. Uh, 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 hip, was your pappy? Fatty. <laughs> Another interesting unused bit is this one line for the ice arena. Because the game didn't take enough pot shots at Fatty Bear. Welcome, sports fans, to the Arctic Land Fatty Bear Memorial Stadium. Lastly, there were some music changes. See, when they did the Dutch version, they swapped out several tracks that had English lyrics with instrumental cues, and those were carried over to the 1999 version. Here you go. Hot cocoa. Are you Masai? I sure am, and am I ever in trouble. I got stuck over here, and the drawbridge won't close. When the zoo first welcomed visitors on March 3rd, 1995, the opening day went off without a hitch. Critics were once more giving it good praise, and like its predecessors, it sold very well. In fact, from just the first three games alone, the series has sold over 1 million units. And in 2001, Saves the Zoo sold an additional 100,972 units. Two years later, Pup Pup will be taken to new historical places in Pup Pup Travels Through Time. In here, Pup Pup and Pep pay a visit to Mr. Firebird, who, following the Skyrocket incident, has converted the fireworks factory into a laboratory just before he heads off to school. What has Mr. Firebird done this time? He's built a brand new time portal that allows one to see into the past and the future. However, just as he starts it up, it malfunctions and causes a wormhole to open up, sending Pup-Putt's history report, school supplies, and Pep into four different time periods. So now, he has to travel to three different points in the past and the future in order to retrieve Pep and all his things and return to the present so that the time portal can be sealed off for good. Man, with all these crazy experiments going wrong, it's no wonder Mr. Firebird didn't make another appearance following this adventure. Just like Goes to the Moon, this one steps out of the series normal comfort zone and goes for a full on sci-fi themed plot. And it does a good job at taking advantage of that. The game has a lot of fun playing around with the various time periods, the characters inhabiting them, the areas found within every period, etc, etc. It also works in not just building Putt-Putt's world, but also shows its history. Not to mention, it can get creative with some of the scenarios Putt-Putt has to face along his journey. The gameplay this time truly changes things up, as this is the first of two games in the series to have interchangeable paths. Talking of which, with all the different ways each item can be found in each setting, the game has a grand total of 16 possible game paths, giving Travels Through Time the distinction of having the most game paths of any of the junior ventures. Anyways, the game ups the challenge with how the player is supposed to retrieve Pup Pud stuff. Sometimes, they can be relatively easy but other times, they require some good creative problem solving and critical thinking. It's also chock full of fun mini games. Follow the Volcano, aka Simon, Picture Jumble, Shoe Crow Shoe, Animal Tracks, and who could forget, Squoosh. This is also noteworthy for being the only game that lets the player paint Puppa in a lighter or darker shade of color.
The backgrounds do a great job at capturing the look of each time period. And the team also did an admirable job of giving each time period a different vibe from one another. The same can be said for the new characters. It's cool seeing the various vehicles of the respective time periods and having their personalities and roles fitting perfectly with their respective periods. Though, they do take the fat puppets from the future or past a little too easy. Also, said personalities are fun, colorful, and memorable. Although, some of the lines, if taken out of context, do come off sounding more suggestive than they actually are. As far as I'm concerned, Putt-Putt, you could drive on me all day and night. Be my guest. I'll give you a ride you won't soon forget. Thanks, Toby. I'm sure I'll take you up on it. Other than that, there's no question that this was another great entry in the series. Now, one interesting bit of trivia. When the game was in production, it was first titled Putt-Putt's Adventure Through Time. But naturally, it was later changed to its final title. I guess going with Putt-Putt's Excellent Adventure would have been too obvious of a choice. For the unused elements, there was a second arcade in the future section, as evidenced by this arcade game room on the RuneSlack map, which suggests there were going to be two arcade games, or it was reworked and moved to another room. Next, there's this amusing easter egg. Animations of what look like self-caricatures of some of the animators hanging out at the end of the desert. For unused music, there's an instrumental rendition of the intro music, though in a lower key, that was used in place of the regular version for some non-English releases. And two songs from the Happy Barb Max Wellington that don't play at all. Help me zip the dragon ass, trying on a saffron dress. So the maiden so smartly tats, you're too big, I must confess. The maiden donned a pretty bonnet, and the dragon found a dress that fit. So off to the royal ball they split, and they were a total hit. There's also some unused dialogue for Putt-Putt. Including, but not limited to... Wake up, Pep! It's muddy around here. It says, shh, quiet. Here's the punch card for the book I want, a story about some animals. Speaking of, by far the most unused content comes from the silly story maker. First off, since King Chariot will never ask for a story of a hero, a scale, or a Pajama Sam, the voice clips done for them can never be heard. Is that cheese that they're throwing? Next, there were three unused stories, and two of which had the narrations recorded. One about a magician, another called Too High, and one about kids, which contains some not-so-subtle plugs to the other series that only exist in text form. One last bit of trivia. The crew wanted the game to start with a fade-in before the intro, but had to scrap it since computers at the time couldn't handle the palette animation. But they were able to add it back in when the game was re-released in 2002. When Puppa returned to the present on June 6, 1997, he had succeeded in his mission. It was the fourth best-selling game in the PC Kids Edutainment category that year, and critics were lauding it calling it outstanding, delightful, and uncomplicated, in a good way, while also giving praise for its abundance of quit points and for being more challenging compared to the other games in the series. The next year would see Putt-Putt entering his biggest competition yet, and Putt-Putt enters the race. In this one, Putt-Putt is invited to join in on the annual Cartown 500 race on behalf of his good friend Redline Rick. However, before he can enter, he needs to get four special items. Special gasoline, racing tires, a safety helmet for Pep, and a racing flag with his official number on it. Thus, Putt-Putt travels across Cartown getting the things he needs, while also helping the other denizens with their problems, 
before he's ready to tear it up on the racetrack. This is a story that just makes perfect sense. After all, it's a series about anthropomorphic cars. He kind of figured they'd eventually do a racing game. After the sci-fi adventure of the previous game, this one returns to a more slice-of-life based plot, and it does a good job at setting up the main goal, where the main locations are at, and what Puppet has to do to get them. On a side note, the game, in many aspects, is essentially an updated version of Joins the Parade, with Puppet needing to get specific items before he can join in a big event. This is just something I noticed when playing through it. The gameplay naturally has you going around Car Town, doing various tasks, and gathering other items in order to get the four needed racing items, and it does a good job with varying them up. This is also the only other game to have any interchangeable paths, though not as many as the last game had. It was so nice to see Car Town again after several games. Sure, we got a glimpse of it at the beginning of Saves the Zoo and in Balloonorama, but this is the first time since Joins the Parade that it's been fully seen in its entirety, and it's great the team went the extra mile to have the first town hub laid out exactly like how it was in Joins the Parade, once again showing how much they love and care about the games. It's also cool how they expanded the town, bringing in new locations, and it's great that they brought back a few side characters from previous games. Not to say anything bad about the new ones, they have some fun and colorful personalities. It also has a couple of fun minigames. Race Pachinko, which actually does require some good timing and strategic thinking, and the actual race. While rather simple in its mechanics, since all you do is just move left and right, it is somewhat challenging given the obstacles the player has to deal with. Crashing or bumping into other racers, skating across oil slicks, and ducks waddling across the track. But if one can avoid those as much as they can, they can pretty much turn the race into a runaway. There's one amusing bit that happens where, on the path where the shed is on fire, if the player dials the operator first, it'll transfer over to 911, and it's the same voice doing both roles. Hello, this is the phone operator. How can I help you? There's a fire! Please hold while I transfer you to 911. This is 911. Please do not hang up until I tell you to. First, what is the problem? Now, this game is not without its problems. For starters, the Pounding Nails minigame is so simple, it can get repetitive very fast. Next, there's the whole collecting bottles section. Although an easier and more convenient way to earn coins than going back and forth to the farm multiple times, the player has to collect and recycle three bottles in order to get one coin back. And sometimes, they won't appear when the player really wants them to, so one will keep going back and forth until they finally spawn, which can lead to a lot of frustration for some players. Lastly, we have the farm maze. Hoo boy! While it does work in making it challenging to get to a particular fruit or vegetable, it is quite tedious, as Puppa can only go as far as the player clicks down the path. It doesn't help either that the maze is huge, and some of the paths can be confusing. Not to mention, Puppa has to be in the exact spot in order to pick any of the fruits and vegetables, and unlike the maze and goes to the moon, he won't automatically exit the maze once he gets all the produce he needs. Aside from those bits, this is another solid entry in the series. There's not a lot of unused elements in this one, but it does have some intriguing pieces of unused dialogue. Like one for Pup Pup when the player uses debug mode to get all the four needed items and then look over the list, but it was removed early on. Looks like I've got everything I need. I should head over to the speedway so I can enter the race. Some bits for when the player reaches the end of the Pounding Nails minigame, but it's very unlikely any player would have been able to hear them given how long and repetitive the minigame is. Also, the Brian mentioned in the second line is referring to programmer Brian Pulliams. 
Congratulations! You are the nail master! You have been rewarded! Brian would be proud of you! And some for cutting the tire patch kit into a circle. But it was removed early on when the developers realized that, since the tools given can only cut in straight lines, it would have been a nightmare trying to cut one out. Next, there's only two unused music cues here. A melodyless version of Betsy Bulldozer's theme, and a melodyless version of Outback Owl's theme. Then, there's a hidden clip point where, if the player holds down shift and clicks on the green car in the Speedway Garage, they can skip the whole body of the game and just go straight to the race. It was likely used by Humongous to get some promo shots. Lastly, but most fascinatingly, the preview for the game partially remains in the finished version. It can only be triggered by running this script code and Room 24 in the debugger. The game was first unveiled at the 1998 Electronics Entertainment Expo in Atlanta, where it went over quite well. And when Puppa officially came out to the starting line on October 16, 1998, he managed to take home the gold. It was the fifth top-selling educational title across 13 software retail chains on the week of January 16, 1999 and the ninth top-selling home education software on the week of May 1st of that year. And critics lauded the game for its animation, the characters, its user interface, for being highly fun, charming, and just being entertaining. Three months after its release, Humongous held a special week-long celebration on their website, where they offered free demos, online games, and contests, and various other items. Two years later, Pup Pup and Pep will be traveling out of Car Town once again for their next adventure, Pup Pup Joins the Circus. In here, Pup Pup and Pep are on their way to Apple Valley to see BJ Sweeney's Big Top Circus. But after they help out their new friend Cassidy, a goat eats Pup Pup's ticket. So, Cassidy gives them a ride straight to the Big Top so they can sort out the problem with BJ Sweeney. When they get there though, they soon learn the circus is in a jumbled mess with things being out of place and especially with the five main acts. Thus, Papa agrees to help get all the acts together before the big grand opening, while also being rewarded free circus tickets for life for doing so. If you help me get this circus up and running, you'll have free circus tickets for life. That's great, since uh, a goat kinda ate my ticket. The game does a good job at establishing the circus, the central problem, where everyone is, and how each of their problems need to be solved, and it does well in varying each of them up, although it doesn't take full advantage of the main location. Also, it does have a couple of humorous bits. Excuse me, are you Philippe the Flea? No. Abracadabra. Hocus Pocus Diddly Ocus. It's also interesting to see how these sentient cars are able to perform their acts. And unlike many of the now defunct circuses, the animals here are actually happy to be a part of it. For the gameplay, they decided to go back to having to follow one linear game path like the first three games had. Unfortunately, this is a rare instance where it's actually detrimental to the overall gameplay. Because it sticks to the same five main acts and the same problems, it doesn't have a whole lot of replayability and it could have benefited from having some interchangeability, though some of the ways the problems are set up are a little clever. Not to mention, not too much randomization apart from changing the ingredients of the power shake recipe, the code for the practice cannon, the shape of the hole in the pool, and which pipes are in the wrong order in the Sorting Pipes minigame. Speaking of, it doesn't help either that the puzzles and minigames here are much simpler and easier than the previous ones. 
sure the past ones were also simple and easy, but at least a few of them had some level of fun and challenge, which most of these don't have. The only exception is the one where you have to find Philippe, as it does keep players guessing where he could be, and it's actually challenging. The cast of characters here are a very mixed bag. There are some fun ones here, but a majority of them have very one note personalities. Also, the ending is really short and kind of feels like an afterthought. I mean, after all the effort and helping get the main act sorted out, what are Putt Putt and the player treated to as a reward for their hard work? A couple of lackluster mini games and a very quick glimpse of all the acts performing their routines. Boy, talk about a huge missed opportunity. Now, all of that being said, this is still far from being a bad game. There are plenty of good things going for it. The backgrounds and overall color scheme do a great job at capturing the circus atmosphere of the time, and again, although most of the new characters were one note, there are a few that are plenty of fun, and it's always nice to see more old characters making a return. Despite it being one of the series' weaker entries, this is still a decently fun game. There's really not a whole lot of unused elements in here, but there are some interesting ones, like an early sketch of the title card, showing that it was originally titled Putt Putt Saves the Circus, and two sketches, one of a close-up on Lester's badge, and another of Lester holding an autographed photo of him and Philippe. Also, there's a cutscene of Putt Putt setting up the trampoline on the left side of the chasm, which is impossible to do in the final game. I think this trampoline will do the trick. Here goes nothing. Lastly, there's only one piece of unused music that's not known where it was going to play. The game made its debut at the 2000 E3 Expo in Los Angeles, where it went over well once more. And when the circus arrived in town on June 19, 2000, the opening night was a great success. Critics were once again giving it good praise, this time for its ability to enhance memory skills and encourage problem solving. And it easily sold very well. In fact, in 2001 alone, it sold an additional 82,400 units in the U.S. Three years later, Pup Pup would help out one special someone in his final adventure in Pup Pup Pep's Birthday Surprise. In here, after coming home from a birthday party, Pup Pup notices that Pep is feeling down. About what, you may be wondering? The fact he's never had a birthday party which is kind of understandable since Peppa doesn't know when it actually is as Pep was lost when he found him. So, as a way to cheer him up, Peppa decides to celebrate Pep's birthday on the anniversary of when they first met, which just so happens to be the very next day. So now, he has to go across Car Town and get all of the needed party items and a cake, all without Pep figuring out what he's really doing. If you think that plot sounds familiar and ridiculous, it truly is ridiculous. While this is both an expected and noble thing for Pup Pup to do, there's a good reason people don't throw birthday parties for their pets, let alone plan a surprise party for one. This plot has plenty of potential and could have allowed for some character building and growth, since it would have worked a lot better if the surprise party was for one of the side characters, like Rover. There's also a lot of missed opportunities, like considering it was on Pup Pup and Pep's anniversary and the day of the Pep Parade, Pup Pup could have made it a very special celebration, or showing the Pep Parade after the party. Not to mention, by having Pep with him the whole time, this created too many instances where Pep should have heard everything or been suspicious about what Pup Pup was really doing like continuously asking him to get Coco for him or Mrs. Goodbake, or being sent off to play with one of his friends. 
it could have easily been fixed by just dropping him off with one of his friends and then coming back for him. Oh, and it has some really weak bits of humor. I guess that's what you call getting your ducks in a row. Will you be ready to put on a big show tomorrow? Of course. Expect me to appear at the party. The gameplay, once again, has the player going around Car Town and gathering up what's needed for the party. But just like with Joins the Circus, it would have benefited from having interchangeable paths. Except for the cake ingredients, where Marvin's magic hat is, and the rubber band's locations, this one doesn't have a lot of replayability. Even more so than the latter did. This is also the only one to not let the player change Putt-Putt's color, except for in one scene. For the backgrounds, since this game was made on a much smaller budget compared to the others, the crew worked around it by recycling a lot of backgrounds, mostly from Enters the Race, though some were retouched, layouts, and some music cues from Saves the Zoo. This also applies to the character animation, though they're no more reused than how other series did it. However, the team can't be blamed too much for the lackluster result, as they were doing the best that they could with what they were given. Now, there are some nice aspects the game does have. The flashback that joins the parade was nice, as well as some clips from past games in the birthday song, more previous characters returning, some of the new ones being enjoyable, and a couple of new locations. Plus, the milk, egg, cake decorating, dog collar, and bunny minigames were decently fun, and it does randomize things more than Joins the Circus did, with the aforementioned ingredients, rubber bands, and the magic hat. But those aren't enough to keep this game from being easily the weakest one of the entire series. Okay, I put off talking about this for long enough, so let's talk about the one aspect that's changed over the course of the series, Putt-Putt's voice. In the first four adventures, as well as the activity packs and the junior arcades, he was voiced by then-child actor Jason Ellefson, who did a great job doing the character and really made the role his own. By the time he did Travels Through Time, he was starting to hit puberty and his voice no longer sounded right for the character. So, for Enters the Race and Joins the Circus, they brought on veteran voice actress Nancy Cartwright to do the voice, and she did a decent job doing the character. As for Pat's birthday surprise, due to Humongous' financial struggles and the game's limited budget, they couldn't afford to have Cartwright reprise the role, so Pup Pup was recast again to Michelle Thorson, who I'm sure did the best job she could, but her performance just didn't work and the voice she did really doesn't fit with Putt-Putt's character. Hi Rover, what's up? The steering wheel, that's what. I look good. I sure am. My calculator. It's the one you've got right there. I need to take it back to the future with me. I'll have a carton of milk, please, Rover. What do you think, Putt-Putt? They're really good pictures, Baby Jumbo. Hi, I'm Putt-Putt. Please be quiet. Not a lot in the way of unused graphics or music, but there are some bits that didn't make it into the finished game. Originally, there was going to be an Apple Orchard minigame where the player would have collected more apples and brought it back to Baldini's grocery store, and a decorations minigame, but it's unknown what it was going to be. Also, the rubber bands were all going to be different colors instead of having them all be brown and there was going to be a party box that would have tied in with the cancelled decorations minigame. Plus, it, along with the confirmation card, were originally going to be separate items from the party bag. Finally, there are three unused clip points. One for the left light of the firehouse that was removed because the lead artist, Lee Berry, didn't like it. The second is one in the sharpening area involving a hang gliding egg. The reason it was removed? It was considered too weird. Yeah, why gets any weirder than the other clip points the company had done over the years. The last is in the party store where it had Fatty Bear unzipping his head to reveal either Pajama Sam, Freddy Fish, Spy Fox, or Pete Wheeler. 
no official reason was given as to why this one got taken out. Would you like to come along? Okay, I'll be right back. But, but... When Papa invited players to the party on August 19th, 2003, it was met with a rather mixed reception. Critics gave it some good reviews, saying that they enjoyed it for its educational aspect, while fans criticized its gaming mechanics, reusing backgrounds and animations from previous games, and for essentially copying the plot of Fatty Bear's birthday surprise. So, it shouldn't come as a shocker that the game didn't sell very well. After that, there wouldn't be another new game made due to the disillusion of Humongous in 2005, but the games would continue to be re-released through the mid-aughts. They would also be released on other gaming platforms, including Steam, the iOS and Android, in the App Store, and the Switch. Also, unlike the other three series, it was fortunate enough to not get a poorly made Wii port. Over the course of its run, Pup Pup would win various awards, including but not limited to Software of the Year, Best Children's Title, a couple of All-Star Software Awards, and a couple of seals of approval. Pup Pup may be the youngest skewing of the Junior Adventures, but it has plenty of fun gameplay, a lot of charm, some humorous moments, and has some fun, colorful, and memorable characters. Up next, we'll be taking a dive into the ocean for Humongous' next adventure series, as we'll uncover and solve various mysteries alongside a young goldfish and her best friend. After Pup Pup became a big hit, the team at Humongous Entertainment naturally wanted to follow up on it, which they did with not just a sequel, but also another original adventure game, that being Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise in March of 1993. However, while it did decently with critics and in sales, it didn't reach the same level of popularity as Pup Pup and the company would have had to pay royalties if they wanted to do more games with the character. So, with the bear not being as popular as the car, what would be their second Junior Adventure series? Well, for that, they'd have to stop looking in a child's toy box, and instead take a dive under the sea to find their next Junior Adventure series, Freddy Fish. The series revolves around Freddy, a young goldfish and her best friend Luther. Together, they solve various mysteries happening across the ocean. Whether it's a haunted schoolhouse, the theft of a precious conch shell, a missing cub seed treasure, or locating a sea monster, they'll do what they can to solve each mystery. But it isn't always easy for them, as they encounter various obstacles and foes while also searching for clues and gathering the necessary items they'll need in order to solve each case. Basically, imagine if Nancy Drew or Carmen San Diego were a six-year-old kid detective that just so happened to be a goldfish. The idea for the project first originated when one crew member, Brad Carlton, drew a short comic strip called Ted's Eyeballs, featuring two fish called Ed and Fred. And yes, you heard it correctly, Freddy was originally a male fish. Together with Ron Gilbert and writer Larry Kay, they proceeded to flesh out the story of the first Fred Fish game. But the project wouldn't fully take shape until one other person came on board. Enter game designer Tammy Borowick. When she joined the team, she made one suggestion that would completely change the course of the game. Change Fred from a boy to a girl. The reason she advocated for this change was because she wanted to upend the very persistent feeling in the game industry that girls would play boy characters, but boys would not play girl characters. However, it had one major hurdle. When she asked Kay to make the changes, he also added in new dialogue for Freddy, like, 
Oh, that's too hard to do. Whenever she was confronted with a difficult puzzle. Unfortunately and sadly at the time, depicting a girl character as being feeble and weak was the norm for many games. However, Borowick pushed back on Addy in lines like that, feeling that they undercut Freddy's character, so they all got taken out. Thank goodness for that, because both the character and the series probably wouldn't have been as fondly looked upon if those lines had remained in. When the game first began production, it was originally being developed for the MS-DOS, much like Fatty Bear and the first two Putt-Putt games, as can be seen in these screenshots from a rarely seen proto-demo. It was about halfway through production, but then, one event occurred that would forever change not just the game's overall direction, but also the entire future of Humongous Entertainment. In 1994, Ron Gilbert was attending a gaming conference where he saw an executive from another kids game company presenting their new game, showing that it was being made using hand-drawn art and animation on paper as opposed to pixels. It was at that moment it dawned on Gilbert that with this new development, it suddenly made what they were doing look old-fashioned and dated. So he decided that would be the direction their games would go in from then on. But there was one little catch. Very few members in the company's crew were trained to do traditional hand-drawn animation. But that didn't stop them from giving it a shot, as they eagerly leapt at the opportunity. It also came at a fortunate time as well, since they were gearing up to upgrade from the MS-DOS to Windows 95. After the decision was made, the first thing the team did was scrap all of the original art that had been previously done and start it all over again. But they kept the overall story and game design intact. From there, they made new fully hand-painted backgrounds that were much bigger and detailed. Then, those backgrounds were scanned in, cleaned up, and rendered in a different aspect ratio. Before then, depending on which series it was, the backgrounds were done in either markers or were painted digitally. Next, they brought on board an animator, the late Louis Scarborough, to help the team get a better idea of how traditional cartoons were done, as well as teaching them about ink and painters, so the animators could concentrate on what they did best. They also began hiring clip point artists, since prior to this, the animators used to do it all themselves. As a result, their project teams went from being just 10 on Putt Putt Goes to the Moon, to around 60 with Freddy Fish. On a side note, they only had one project lead for the entire game, and that was Tammy Borowick, so you can imagine it was a pretty tough task to do. So with all of that, the first Freddy Fish game was born. Oh, and if you're curious if Putt Putt Saves the Zoo started out the same way, no, it was made for Windows 95 right from the start of production. Now, I've already broken down how the games get made in the Pup Pup video, so what I said there applies here and for the rest. Anyways, it's time to get on with the show. In the first game, The Case of the Missing Cup Seeds, Freddy learns that Grandma Grouper's cup seed treasure has been stolen, and if it isn't recovered soon, the entire ocean's food supply will be gone and all the fish will die. And no, they don't dance around it, they straightforwardly say they will die right at the start. We need to find Grandma Grouper's treasure chest because that's where the kelp seeds are. If we don't find them soon, all the fish are going to die. So now, it's up to Freddy and Luther to find and follow the clues left in bottles and get the location of the kelp seed treasure before it's too late. As the first game in the series, it's a pretty good way to get the series started. It's a pretty simple mystery adventure, but it's plenty of fun, has some good and funny moments, is charming, and can actually get a little suspenseful at certain points. 
the team also did a good job at introducing players to the world and the characters, setting up the mystery and where everything is laid out. Some of the puzzles are cleverly put together and require a bit of creative problem solving. The characters are charming, fun, and colorful, though a couple might come off grating to some, and the antagonists make for some humorous villains. The bottle ain't here, boss. Maybe somebody else found the voice. <laughs> Maybe somebody else found it first. Of course someone else found it first, you sponges! The gameplay here is fairly simple and straightforward. You go around finding the clues and collecting the necessary items needed to help further progress through the game. One nice touch they added was giving the option to rescue some of the side characters, and if the player does so, they'll make an appearance at the end of the game. There's also some fun side sections. The feeding animals and the pearls in the oyster minigame work in bringing relief to some players. The theater is another fun side section, with the various performances the fish put on. Another minigame worth mentioning is Mr. Starfish's Math Quiz. It's exactly what the name says. You do a series of math questions based on the difficulty you set it to and correctly answer them. Also, one can do it for as long as they want to. It's pretty much the most educational part of the game, though it probably did help some kids out with math. The backgrounds are very lavishly detailed and work well in invoking that naturalistic ocean feel, while also making it feel big, as well as getting creative with some of the locations. As for the character designs and animation, while they are a bit rough around the edges, it's still pretty smooth, and having some background bubbles popping up occasionally is a nice detail. It also has a slightly darker atmosphere compared to the other games, since it does take place around late afternoon, early evening, and it does carry the burden of the entire fish population's fate resting in the character's fins. Even though obviously, no one actually ends up dying in the game. As for the actual mystery itself, it's decently set up, and having the bottles being in different locations adds to its replayability, as well as how one goes about retrieving them using the items they've collected along the way. However, it could have been built up and interconnected better, which leads into some of the flaws. For one, as this was the very first humongous entertainment game to be fully animated and hand-drawn, there are numerous times where the characters would go off model, even more so than in Putt Putt Saves the Zoo. However, this is forgivable, since again, this was the first game animated like this, and the team was just getting used to it. Also, they hadn't yet learned to put together character model sheets, so each animator would draw the characters in their own style. Next, there are the way the items are laid out. Now, as I already said, they are necessary for solving the puzzles and advancing to the next part of the game. The problem is, there are some items that aren't needed for a specific path, and by having them all available at once, it ends up rendering many of them useless, and the player will end up with items they didn't need to get by the end. Good examples, the amount of purple surgeons collected, and the glowing shell. Also, there's the whole having arrow signs on almost every screen bit. Although helpful in making sure younger players don't get lost, it does end up giving the game that holding hand feel. Lastly, there's how the whole conflict gets resolved. Now, it's not terrible in the slightest, and it does have a decent moral, that it's better to share the wealth with others rather than hogging it all to oneself but it gets resolved a bit too easily and quickly. I mean, all Freddy does is suggest to the sharks that they all share the kelp seeds, while also stating that the kelp seeds are for everyone, and they agree to go with it. Boom! The conflict's over, and they bring the kelp seeds back to Grandma Grouper. It feels like there should have been a little more added at the end to make it feel more complete. With all that said, though, those flaws don't take away from the game's level of fun and enjoyment, and as I said at the start, 
it's a good beginning for the series. Okay, before we go on, let's briefly talk about the game's demo. What makes this one worth mentioning? Well, for the most part, the puzzle in it is the same as it is in the actual game, with having to free Gabby from under the rocks in the cave. But, there are some notable differences. For one, the wooden board is in the area next to the cave instead of being near the beach. Also, Freddy refers to the board as a plank and it automatically goes into the inventory rather than having either Freddy or Luther picking it up. It's a wooden plank. Next, the opening scene is slightly quicker and has some exclusive animation not found in the actual game. Also, there is one composite error when Mrs. Halibut rams into the cave entrance. Finally, for whatever reason, probably to make the demo longer, the old whale bones are part of the cave as opposed to being a separate area, and they even added a small opening and shining light to make it more like an entryway. Also, like before, there are some special lines added in for Freddy. Gabby's not here, but I'm sure we'll find him if we keep looking. Some animations of the duo swimming further down through the bones, and they flip the area where Gabby's stuck in to better match the direction they're coming in from. Now, as I've previously stated in the prologue, this is the first humongous game to have interchangeable game paths. But, it should be noted that the SCUM engine was always built to support multiple puzzle pads, since it was first designed for Maniac Mansion. Like I said in the Pup Pup video, there are a few elements that do get randomized there. The street you start on first, which apartment floors you go to, baby beep shape and color, etc, etc. Heck, even Fatty Bear had this by changing up the item's locations. Freddy Fish just so happened to be the first series to implement it for the game pads. Plus, it makes perfect sense. After all, it is a mystery game series, giving them just one linear game path with little random bits changed up like Papa and Fatty Bear had would have made it less replayable and enjoyable. Now of course, I can't talk about this game without bringing up one of its most well-known hidden easter eggs. What you thinking about, Freddy? Oh, nothing, Luther. This was done by animator Tom Berry as a way to just blow off some steam. Honestly, it's a very thankful thing this wasn't in the final game because they would have received floods of angry letters from parents all about it. But that's not the only notable unused element that didn't make it. There are a couple of clip points that were left out of the final version. One involving a hanging fish skeleton in Mr. Starfish's room, and this seemed to have been a last minute change, as it can be seen in a couple of pre-release screenshots. And also, if you look real carefully, you can spot an out of place cutout in the rocks. The others are on the sunken ship's deck where there are two animations of the sword's handle coming to life. It's not known why these ones were removed. Also, there are some unused music cues, consisting of one that's nearly identical to another piece, but had Tiki-esque chanting in it, which didn't make it due to either not finding the right place for it, or because it slightly plays into some Islander stereotypes. Another one meant for the sunken ship, which may or may not have been done as a possible fallback, but it can't be accessed since the player is locked into that area until the end. Two cues meant for the king's castle that don't play due to how the game engine handles the music.
a variant of one of the background cues, but with vocals. Freddy, we need your help, please. We need to find the missing help seats. Freddy, we need your help. We need to find the missing help. And the full version of the shark's theme. When Freddy and Luther first got on the case on October 28, 1994, they did a good job solving it. Just good. Critics gave the game mixed reviews, saying that it was a little too wheezy, the actual mystery being on the weak side, and felt it didn't take full advantage of its underwater setting. But they did give it great praise for the animation, gameplay, the puzzles, and the music. As for the game sales, it did pretty well. In fact, by 1999, it had sold a combined total of 250,000 units, with an additional 54,447 units sold in 2001. Freddy Fish's success would become quite a significant one for the company. Sure, Putt-Putt succeeded in establishing Humongous' presence in the market and getting him off the ground, but Freddy Fish was credited as the one that put their name on the map, and with good reason. At the time, there were very few PC games one could find that featured this kind of quality animation and detailed backgrounds. It was featured on an episode of the PBS show The Computer Chronicles, and was bundled as a bonus with the kids' accessory, the Microsoft Easy Ball. However, what really cemented Freddy's success was when Bill Gates showcased it at the 1994 Condex event in Las Vegas as an example of the capabilities of Windows 95. You know they made it big when Bill Gates gave their game an endorsement. Two years later, Freddy and Luther would be off to school and get somewhat paranormal for their next case in the case of the Haunted Schoolhouse. In here, Freddy and Luther are off to school, and today it's show and tell day, with Luther bringing in his favorite action figure. When they arrive, however, they find out that the school is being haunted by a ghost, and that said ghost is stealing all of their schoolmates' toys. So they give chase in order to get all the toys back, but they soon quickly discover that the ghost is nothing more than someone in a costume. So. Freddy devises a trap in order to capture him, but it's missing a few items. Thus, Freddy and Luther go all over the area, collecting all the items needed to complete it, while of course, helping out others along the way. It's about as much of a Scooby-Doo style mystery as this series is going to get. If I can use one word to describe this game as it is compared to the first one, it'd be crystallized. The team did an amazing job improving nearly every aspect from the first game. Yes, the story and conflict are sillier this time around, the tone is much lighter compared to the first game, and again, the mystery is very Scooby-Doo-like, but it does have more reasonable stakes and also feels much more whole, as the mystery is woven in much better and does a good job at keeping players engaged we get more insight into why the sharks are after the kids' toys, and both sides do get what they want in the end. There's also plenty of humorous moments. Hey Luther, how about giving me a hand? I really appreciate the great job you're doing. Mm -hmm. Chocolate-covered worm doodles. My favorite. Plus, the Rube Goldberg trap at the end was pretty fun to watch. The game also does a great job at further building Freddy Fish's world, bringing in new locations and introducing new characters into the mix, as well as bringing back some from the last one. This is also where the purple sea urchins are firmly established to be a form of currency, as opposed to being used as only ballast like in the first game. This game is also partly a musical, 
as it has several songs throughout it that only last for a brief time whenever the player clicks on an instrument or a character. But even then, some of them are very peppy and catchy to listen to. A fish is a creature that lives in the sea. It's charming and handsome. Exactly like me. Hey nanny nanny and a hot cha cha. Hey nanny nanny and a hot cha cha. For the gameplay, it has been greatly improved upon, as now the player only collects the items necessary for a specific path, apart from the sea urchins, and it makes sure none of them go unused. Speaking of the paths, it has 8 possible game paths in total, whereas the first one had 7. They also greatly scale back with the on-screen arrow signs, as there's now only a handful of them and they tell the player where each of the main locations are at. The puzzles this time around were more challenging and required more problem solving, critical thinking, and memorizing. The mini games in this, Crab Invaders, Drawing on the Chalkboard, and the Slide Puzzle are very enjoyable, and the latter is necessary in order to get one of the items, though fortunately, the player doesn't have to solve the puzzle in order to get it. The movie theater is another fun little side section, with some funny movie clips. You gotta have them. Mmm, mmm, worm doodle. Squishy, squashy, worm doodle. In all your favorite flavors. Original, chocolate, sea cucumber, lemon, orange, red, and new fat free. Grab them, because you gotta have them. And even providing an early glimpse at Spy Fox. As for the character animation, it is much smoother and more fluid, and you can tell the crew started working with model sheets as the character designs received a much needed refinement and polish. Talking of which, the new characters here are fun, colorful, and charming. So all told, you've got yourself a solid follow-up that did a great job in working out many of the kings of its predecessor. Now. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this memorable moment from the game. Well, so it is. <laughs> you boys will be wanting the combination to the trophy case. Excuse me, sir, but I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. There's actually an interesting reason this line was put in. See, not long after the first game came out, some people were confused as to whether Freddy was a boy or a girl which is understandable seeing as she doesn't have any distinctive feminine characteristics like long eyelashes. Tammy Borowick slipped in that line in order to set the record straight. This was also further cemented in Freddy Fish 5. Coincidentally, similar to Putt-Putt, this game marks the only time a human is ever heard in a Freddy Fish game. I could have sworn I felt a nibble. This would later be referenced and retconned in Spy Fox 3. Not much in the way of unused elements in this one, but there are plenty of notable bits. For instance, there's a hidden easter egg where, if one clicks on the globe, a duplicate of the screen will appear on the chalkboard. It can be activated if one inputs this line in the INI files. Another hidden easter egg is where, if one puts this line in, the ghost scenes will always occur no matter what. For unused graphics, there are several variant cursors for the purple sea urchins, where one could pick up two to five of them, but they were cut since one can only take one at a time out of the inventory. There's also two blank versions of the Vote Freddy for Class Prez and Go Marlins banners, likely done to make it easier for the translators. Interestingly, there's some animation of Freddy and Luther untying Captain Schnitzel, showing that there was originally a rope path where the captain was going to be all tied up, as well as a standalone animation of him just sitting up, but they didn't make it. Next, there's some storyboard drawings of Freddy and Luther talking with Mr. Triplefin where he's shown smoking a pipe and Freddy and Luther giving an unpleasant reaction. This suggests the character wasn't going to be very friendly, but it was changed for the final game. 
Then, there's an unused movie clip of the 94-95 Humongous logo, which was probably meant to show before each movie instead of the countdown. But it was cut since this was the first game to debut the more iconic logo, and a couple of toys for the credits. For unused dialogue, there are six bits of them. One for when Luther's action figure is being examined, which wouldn't have been possible since it's only seen at the very beginning, which even then it's not clickable, and it's not an inventory item. It's Luther's Codfish Commando action figure. Two lines for having six or seven urchins in the inventory, but it is impossible as only five purple sea urchins can be found in the game. We have six purple sea urchins. We have seven purple sea urchins. A line for when the sharks are unmasked, which was cut for either just staying the obvious or to avoid being redundant. It's those sharks. An alternate line for Freddy after Eddie refuses to give the life preserver. Sorry, we didn't mean to bother you, sir. And one for the debug menu when one is trying to add in a sixth urchin. We have enough sea urchins. Finally, there's an unused song for Barnacle Bob that didn't make it since the Pulley Emporium only has four pulleys in it. I'll bet there's a neat story behind that pulley. When the Great Titanic sank, Leaving its twisted remains, I made my way through the metal debris to find this pulley and chains. When Freddy and Luther arrived at school on September 10th, 1996, they had no trouble cracking the ghost case. Critics gave the game more praise than the first game, stating that the mystery plot was very involving, while also praising the animation, characters, and musical numbers, and that it works as a very fitting sequel. So with all of that, it should come as no surprise that the game went on to become another big sales winner. Leaping forward two years, and Freddy and Luther will be heading to the tropics for their next big case, in the case of the stolen conch shell. In this, Freddy and Luther are on vacation and are invited to the Founders Day Festival on behalf of Luther's Uncle Blenny. When they arrive, however, they find out Uncle Blenny's been put in the slammer. For what, you may ask? The Great Conch Shell was stolen. The Founders Day Festival can't start without it. Since I'm the grand exalted keeper of the conch, I'm the prime suspect. But I didn't do it. So now, they have to go across the area investigating, gathering up clues, and locate the three golden pipes in order to find the real conch shell thief and prove Uncle Blenny's innocence. The plot and mystery this time around is more of a typical caper, with multiple suspects and how and why they each could have done the crime, which works perfectly for Freddy Fish as it allows for plenty of various gameplays. Speaking of which, with the number of locations the golden pipes could possibly be in on any given path, the game has a grand total of 8 different paths, creating 18 different possible gameplays. Once more, the gameplay has the player going across the town, gathering up what they need to get the golden pipes, and the locations are some of the most creative ones the series has had so far, and are the most vibrant and colorful as well. Also, it's always great to see more world building being done, and it was nice to see Pelican Sam make his return here. The puzzles here have upped the challenge more than in the first two, as some are multi-part and have varying levels of difficulty. It also does a good job at shaking things up a bit. Toward the end, Luther gets trapped for trying to steal the jewel, and Freddy has to rescue him or they can't leave the temple. It's unique in that it's the first time only one character, Freddy, does a section solo. The mystery itself was much less predictable, as they've retired the sharks and the squid father in favor of having multiple outcomes, which does a great job at keeping the players on their toes as they'll never know who the thief will be each time it's played. The mini games here, the pipe organ, floating fun, the wanted poster, and the tumble tubes are very fun and enjoyable despite being a bit on the easy side, 
and two of them need to be played in order to get one of the two golden pipes. There is also five songs in here, and they're all pretty darn catchy, and the stage show is a fun side section. The new characters introduced here are some of the most lively, charming, and colorful bunch in the series, though some of them do play into some stereotypes. Excuse me sir, but are you a tailor? Not just a tailor. I am Pierre the Tailor. The character animation is the most fluid and best looking it's ever been, and the animators did an amazing job with it, as well as adding in little background details, from the bubbles and water ripples, to more subtle bits like the red glow emanating out of the volcano, the tunnel's eyes moving, and the flow of the waterfall. All in all, with an engaging caper and some fun characters, this was another solid entry in the series. Now, one note I'd like to add is that the idea of having multiple endings was thought up by Mark Pizer during the making of Freddy Fish 2. They originally wanted to do it for that game, but couldn't as it was too far into production. But they were able to with this, as they built it in right from the start. There's only a handful of unused elements here, but they are rather fascinating. To start with, there are several sets of unused cursors. Like in the last game, there are variants for picking up 2-5 purple sea urchins, which once again wouldn't have worked since only one urchin can be taken out at a time, and the fact there are only 4 in the whole game some for the folder, which was pointless since it's just used to remind the player what's happening, some for the flashlight and the foreign language phrase book that don't get used as the former is skipped altogether, and the latter is nothing more than an in-game graphic, and there are cursors for the three golden pipes, and even one for four of them, which can't be used since the player goes directly to the temple after the third pipe is found, and it's impossible to get four golden pipes. Speaking of, there are three unused inventory bubbles for the thief's bag, along with its own set of cursors, which can't be used anyway. It's the bag that the cart thief dropped. Five sea urchins, which again really wouldn't have worked given there are only four, and one for four golden pipes, which doesn't make sense since there are just three pipes to find in the game. Finally, there is a handful of unused dialogue. A bit for Luther after putting the jewel back in place. Now let's get out of here! Five bits of the other suspects proclaiming, I did it! 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 And five for Freddy in the deep bug screens. We have enough sea urchins. We have enough golden pipes. Selecting this golden pipe means Nadine can't be the wallet owner. Pierre or Blenny will be chosen instead. You must deselect the surface golden pipe first. You must deselect an urchin first. When the conch shell was recovered on March 31st, 1998, the duo succeeded in exonerating Uncle Blenny. Critics gave the game great praise for its plot and mystery, animation, gameplay, and for just being an entertaining game. So, to no one's surprise, it went on to be another bestseller in the series. The next year would see Freddy and Luther heading out west for their next mystery with the case of the Hogfish Rustlers of Briny Gulch. In this one, Freddy and Luther are on a trip to Freddy's cousin's ranch to be taught how to raise hogfish. But upon arrival, they learn that all of Cousin Calgo's hogfish have been rustled by some hogfish rustlers. Soon, they learn that the hogfish are being held up in the rustler's hideout, the Rusty Rustler. The only problem though, is that only rustlers can get into the hideout. Thus, they have to get together a rustler disguise so they can get in and rescue the hogfish. Before I go on, let me just say right now, if you're not a fan of westerns or western settings, then this will affect your enjoyment of this game. Now, with that said, going from a tropical environment setting to a western one was an interesting choice. Like the previous game, the mystery is a caper, 
this time all about rustling some hogfish and why the rustlers did it. But it changes just enough things up to make it a different take. And having Freddy and Luther eating to disguise themselves in order to get into the hideout is a fresh spin, since the others always had them automatically go to the last area. It was also good to see them do a twist on the old cattle or sheep rustling storyline. The rustler's motives for stealing the hogfish being they want to be hogfish ranchers themselves instead of selling them off for a profit was a good and unexpected spin. However, even with that going for it, this game has a lot of flaws. For starters, the plot feels like a step down from the last one. The stakes in here are more personal given that Calico raised and cared for all of the hogfish herself but it oddly feels a bit smaller. I mean, this is going from stealing a priceless conch shell to rustling some hogfish. That there alone is a step down. Also, how come Gruntle's the only hogfish who can talk? Yes, it was shown the hogfish are sentient to an extent, but up until that point, they never inferred that they could speak. There are also fewer suspects in here with only 4 out of the 13 characters you meet having to be involved with the rustling. The new cast of characters are a pretty mixed bag. There are some that are fun and charming, with one from the previous game returning, while the others are just one note and don't have interesting personalities beyond their one shtick. The backgrounds and locations while nice looking and they do a great job at invoking the western setting and atmosphere, do make the game look a little samey, since the main color palette is brown mixed in with a little green, blue, and purple. Now all that being said, this is very far from being an awful game. The puzzles, though on the simpler side, do still require creative thinking, memorizing, and problem solving. Not to mention, it does have a good amount of genuinely funny moments sprinkled in. The Nickelodeon, Oystroid Arcade, and Wanted Poster are fun little side sections for the players and the former and latter help further add to the western theme. Also, despite the smaller number of suspects, the way they set up the reveal of Mr. Big is pretty clever. Instead of saying who the culprits were out of the gate, they planted little hints through the character's actions that one of them could possibly be behind it. It also does a good job at giving reasons why the others couldn't have been behind the whole caper. And, as I said earlier, Despite the limited color palette, the backgrounds do a great job at capturing the western atmosphere and some of the new characters are charming and enjoyable. Even being one of the series weaker entries, it's still overall an enjoyable and fun game. There's not a whole lot of unused elements in this one, but there is one interesting bit worth mentioning. A bit of dialogue between Freddy and Luther about tying up the rope around the shark but it got cut due to it being impossible to get the rope on the starfish path. It's also the only game to not have any character cameos from the other humongous series. Lastly, there's a different version of the theme used when Nelson is assembling the belt buckle. When Freddy and Luther rescued the hogfish on November 5th, 1999, they were successful in cracking another caper. In fact, in 2001 alone, the game went on to sell an additional 65,106 copies, and critics were once more praising it for its animation, characters, story, gameplay, and for being more challenging compared to the previous entries. Two years later, the duo would be heading up to the park for what would be their final case in the case of the creature of Coral Cove. In this, Freddy and Luther are off to have a fun day at Coral Cove Park. 
But when they get there, they soon learn the park has been closed due to some recent sightings of a giant sea monster. And the citizens are about to form an angry mob and about ready to send it packing. So, the duo decide to investigate and see just why the sea monster is frightening everybody away. However, they soon learn that this particular mystery runs a lot deeper than they initially thought. As far as being the final entry in the series, it definitely went out on a high note. The mystery here is a good step up from the previous one. It's another caper, but this time, Freddy and Luther have to uncover what the sea monster really wants and the real reason why it's been scaring everyone away from the park. And it does a great job in building it up. It also made great use of misdirection. It tries to fool players into thinking it's another Scooby-Doo mystery where it all points to it being just a guy in a monster suit, only to then reveal, through some hints and clues, not only is that not the case, but it also shows the mystery goes deeper than it lets on. Like the others, the gameplay has players go around the town and the park getting the needed clues and items, and it does a good job at shuffling up the paths and how they're supposed to get the needed items. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but other times they require some tricky problem and puzzle solving. Speaking of, the puzzles in this are among the trickiest ones the series has done yet. There are many multi-part ones that require plenty of memorizing, decision making, and again, puzzle and problem solving. The Tide Pools and Mess Hall Mania are really fun minigames that do work in giving a fun break in the middle of the investigation, as well as the former providing a specific item. Just like in 3, there's one section where a character does it solo, this time being Luther. As for the animation, it received a bit of a boost here. Sure, it's mostly the same from 3 and 4, but there are some new ones done for the cutscenes, and they do look quite nice. And there is some good camera work in point, like this panning shot as they're swimming through the town. Also, it was nice to see a couple of old characters make their return here, especially with Casey, as he helps out in cracking the mystery. And while I'm still on about the characters, they have some of the most fun personalities of all the games, and even subvert some common character tropes. An interesting touch they added here is having only a couple of them appear on a specific path, so one won't see them all at once in a single playthrough. So with all of that, you've got yourself another solid entry, and once again, a great one for the series to end with, even if it wasn't planned to be so. Unfortunately, there aren't any unused elements that were left out of the finished game. Really, it's just a bunch of leftovers from the other games and the logo's color palette, along with, for some reason, one track from Putt Putt Joins the Parade and one from Travels Through Time. The only true unused element in it is an empty blue room, but that's really it. When the duo uncovered the sea monster mystery on June 19th, 2001, they succeeded in finding the real culprit. Critics were once again giving the game great praise, and it easily became another sales success, selling 119,739 units in North America. Following afterwards, there wouldn't be another game developed due to the new heads not wanting to do any more of them, and their priorities switching over to the backyard sports. Interestingly, had the Junior Venture games been allowed to continue on, they would have all made the switch over to CGI, like how Backyard Sports did. How they would have looked, though, is another story. On another fascinating note, Freddy Fish is the only series to have the same voice actors for the two main characters, with Freddy herself being voiced by Annette Tatangi, and Luther was voiced by Mike McGolliffe. The others had to recast their leads for various outside reasons. Funny, ain't it? There were a couple of attempts to revive the series in the late aughts, with Freddy Fish ABC Under the Sea for the Nintendo DS, and porting the first game over to the Wii. 
but both ended up being failures in more ways than one. On the plus side, the series would be re-released on other platforms throughout the rest of the decade, before eventually getting released on Steam, Android, the Switch, and the App Store. Freddy Fish would win numerous awards throughout its run, including Best Children's Game, an All-Star Software Award, some awards of excellence, and even Family Life's Critics' Choice Award. Freddy Fish might seem like your average young kids mystery series, but it's a lot more than that, thanks to its good writing, charming and lovable characters, gameplay with some creative problem solving, imaginative scenarios, and having a lot of charm and funny moments that even adults will enjoy. Now, we move on from ocean mysteries to conquering various childhood fears, as we'll be exploring the creative worlds of a young superhero's imagination. would turn out to be a pretty big and busy year for Humongous. First, they'd be purchased by GT Interactive, which was very fortunate for them as they needed the financing, and it didn't hurt that GT took a hands-off approach and allowed the company to continue running operations their way. The second was the launch of their subdivision Cave Dog Entertainment, and the debut of the Junior Arcade spin-off line, which the latter allowed them to put out more games in a year. Plus, it helped that the team really enjoyed making them. Lastly, but most important of all, it would be the debut of their third junior adventure series, Pajama Sam. The games center on Sam, a six-year-old boy who is a huge fan of the comic superhero Pajama Man. Many times, he has a fear or problem that he must overcome. So, he dons his cape and becomes his hero persona, Pajama Sam, and ventures into new fantastical worlds, be it a weather factory or an island inhabited by sentient foods created by his own imagination, while also helping to fix other problems along his journeys. Basically, all of the essential duties for a young superhero to do. The idea for the project first began when Ron Gilbert thought of the idea for it. However, it was a rather vague one, since at that point, the title character didn't have a name yet. In fact, at the start of production, he was called, and I swear I'm not making this up, fill in the blanks boy. So after tossing around some names for a while, he ultimately settled on the Pumpkinhead boy which, by the way, had nothing to do with Halloween. He also originally didn't wear footy pajamas either. About a month into its development, the company's head of marketing told Gilbert they couldn't do it, and it would be for two reasons. One was because they were worried about provoking a lawsuit from Turner Broadcasting, as the name sounded too close to a character from The Wizard of Oz, Jack Pumpkinhead. The other concern they had with it was seasonality. Because the character had a pumpkin for a head, and the fact most people tend to associate that with autumn, especially Halloween, they would immediately assume it was a Halloween game and thus would only be available during that time period. At first, Gilbert balked at changing the character's name, but after giving it some thought, he concluded the head of marketing was right. So, he brought the team together to pitch several different names. After going through several of them, including some notable names like Bedhead Ned and even Slumberjack, at the suggestion of artist Rafael Colonzo Jr., they finally settled with Pajama Sam. However, the whole name change story wouldn't be lost on them, as it would go on to be referenced in the first game. Pumpkinhead Boy, A Brief Tragedy Once upon a time, there was a boy who had a pumpkin for a head. But then his lawyers told him to lose the pumpkin because they feared a lawsuit by that big guy in Atlanta. 
and they were concerned about seasonality, so he lost the pumpkin, and then he was blue. The end. I think I've heard that story before. As for the game's overall story, it was virtually unchanged compared to the fittest version, with Sam needing to reclaim his stuff so he can go and capture darkness. But there were a few notable differences. First, instead of his mask, it was originally going to be his cape that would have been taken away. Next, the Land of Darkness was initially a more swampy, tree-infested, and gloomy landscape devoid of any light. But of course, that didn't end up being the case. Also, the customs and specter trees at the beginning were originally guardian trees. Finally, the river was going to have rapids in addition to the waterfalls and underground cavern, but it eventually got dropped. On a side note, Pajama Sam is notable for being the first ever human protagonist in a humongous game. Yes, there was Kayla and her father at the beginning and end of Fatty Bear's birthday surprise and the ones in Let's Explore the Airport, but they weren't really fully rounded characters and the former only served as the driving force of that game's plot. Though, one could say her character was more inferred than anything else. Another note, compared to Puppa and Freddy Fish, Pajama Sam is a little more mature, more of which we'll get into later. Now, with all of that out of the way, it's time to explore the worlds of Sam's imagination. Beginning with no need to hide when it's dark outside, on his first night sleeping with the lights off, Sam is naturally scared to fall asleep especially with the presence of darkness in his closet. So, he decides to enter his closet and gets transported to the Land of Darkness in order to capture him. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, it would have been, except that some trees end up confiscating his stuff and scattering them all over the land. So now, Sam has to go across the Land of Darkness and get them all back while also meeting and helping new friends and overcoming various obstacles before he can capture darkness. This game truly started the series off on the right foot. It does a great job at setting up the conflict, establishing the world of the game, and its mechanics at the beginning. It also has a great amount of humorous moments sprinkled in. Darkness may already have won a fabulous million dollar prize. Yeah, right. Wandering passages deep down where the rocks are hot gets heated up to the point where it would normally turn into steam. Except it doesn't because of the pressure of all the other water on top of it. Wow, I'm rich! <laughs> Internal Revenue Service. I'm going to have to take some of that for taxes. You can keep this moldy piece of cheese. As for the ending, it works as a nice subversion of the usual climactic scene, as it doesn't resort to using violence, and by presenting darkness as someone who doesn't want to cause trouble, but instead is a lonely person who just wants some friends to have fun with. Oh dear. No one ever wants to come over and play fun games with me. You like to play games? Yes, but I never have anyone to play with. At night, when I come out, everybody's asleep. You mean you don't have any friends? Well, no. The main conflict works on a personal level because it derives from a very relatable place. Let's be honest. Who wasn't afraid of the dark at one point in their childhoods and wished they could just vanquish it? In a way, it's basically giving players the chance to live out that old childhood fantasy. Like many other humongous games, the main gameplay has you going around the land of darkness collecting the needed items. And the team did a good job with changing up where Sam's three items are at, as well as what the player needs to get and do in order to retrieve them. Some of the paths are rather straightforward, while others require a bit of tricky problem and puzzle solving.
The backgrounds and overall atmosphere really work well in capturing that dark and somewhat unsettling feeling, but also made sure it wasn't too dark so as not to frighten younger kids away, and they do have some fun with the locations. It also has a great amount of detail and nice touches, like having various random objects scattered about the land, as well as some areas resembling various rooms in Sam's house, and having the layout of Darkness's room mirror Sam's. For the character animation, while it's a bit rough around the edges, it's very smooth, and in some scenes like the dancing furniture one, can get really lively, and the designs though, again, a little rough around the edges, work well in making it believable that these objects can come to life. On a side note, this game is where the team started experimenting with matching the mouth movements with the audio, but it's only during the cutscenes. Don't try to butter me up. If you want to go across, you'll have to pay a toll. How much is the toll? One pound of gold. The rest of the time, it's like how it was with the early Freddy Fish and Pup Puck games. Declare? Well, no, I guess not. I, um... The series is known for having optional mini side quests for the players to complete. In this one, you collect ten pairs of different colored socks hidden across the land. But they're always hidden in different locations, and some are more well hidden than others. There's also a couple of fun and entertaining mini-games. The Brain Tickler is a fun trivia game that can actually get challenging, though it does throw in a few wildcard questions in there. Let me try computer science. Alright, here is your question. What is the best computer programming language? Only a geek would worry about something like that. That's absolutely right! Another good one is Cheese and Crackers. Sure, it's just a variant on Tic-Tac-Toe, but it's still enjoyable regardless. Oh, and who could forget Nuggets, aka Remote Mining Terminal. Yeah, many of the later levels become tedious, but it does add to the challenge. Another fun side section is the Potion Mixing Lab, where one can mix up various concoctions, and they can have some humorous results. The characters here are certainly a creative bunch that also have some memorable personalities. One thing I'd like to add is that Sam himself is one of the most relatable characters Humongous ever made. He's just a regular kid with common fears and obsessions everyone had at some point in their lives and a strong imagination while also avoiding many of the pitfalls that befell many other child characters. He may be young, but he knows what to do in a given situation, can be rather clever in figuring problems out, and works well with the stuff he's got. He's also got a good amount of wit and snark. However, what really elevated the character is that he's brought to life by the incomparable Pamela Adlin who is notable for being the first big-name voice actor in the Humongous cast. Hey! What a rip-off! His interests include skydiving, channeling ancient spirits, and stamp collecting. I don't collect stamps. You're making that up. All in all, you've got yourself a solid game and a solid start to the series. Now, Going back a bit to its development, there were many early ideas and designs the team went through before settling with what ended up in the final game. A good example, King's original design looked like he came straight out of Thomas the Tank Engine, with his face just placed on the front of a minecart, but naturally it was reworked so that his face was incorporated into the cart instead. But if you watch carefully, you can spot his prototype version cruising along the tracks in certain shots. Next, Darkness's house initially started as a more standard looking treehouse, and the Doors of Knowledge was originally the Door O Knowledge. Yeah, try to imagine the questions being given in a more straight-faced serious manner instead of being more like a quiz show.
Also, there were a good amount of unused elements that were removed and some hidden easter eggs, which include special cursors for Sam's items and the blue potion bottle, animation of Sam using one of the oars to try to get his lunchbox out of the river, which is impossible to do since the oars aren't available on that path, some storyboard sketches involving a couple of clip points for the anti-gravity hall, a bit involving Sam's cape getting caught in the rotating door, Sam trying to use the oil can with the potion mixing bottle, which can't be done anyway, and some bit of animation of him trying to use the hammer on the chair without the nail. And he looks completely psychotic and about ready to break that chair to smithereens! Let's be thankful this didn't make it into the finished game, because this would have been easily taken out of context. On a much lighter note, in the kitchen, if the player does a few specific steps, the dumbwaiter will actually sing an extra verse. Give it to me and I'll take it right up The darkness where he'll gobble it up There's also an unused music cue that's not exactly known where it was meant to play, but it's most likely it would have been played at the boat docks. There's some interesting unused recording as well, like this bit for Otto. Hmm, I think it's safe now. It was most likely meant to play in the geyser area, and is possibly a remnant of when it was originally a timed puzzle. But, it does play during the credits. The second was this exchange with King after the players already got a piece of gold, and Sam remarks he'd rather have a gold nugget of cheese. But due to a scripting error, it doesn't play. Hey, who wouldn't? Finally, there were a couple of glitches that snuck in. One was an invisible sock that spawned on one of the trees near the well, and if the player picked it up and put it in the basket, it would cause the whole game to crash. Thankfully, it was fixed up in the 1999 revision. Speaking of which, the second glitch happens in said revision, where for some reason, some of the well's dialogue isn't Dutch. Wouldn't you be even better off if you made two streams? Then you'd have twice as much water. Oh, Brayden, eh? Interessant idee. Have you thought about my two stream idea yet? Ik ben nog bezig met het voorontwerp. Het is een ingewikkelde affaire. Now, this was because the developers used the Dutch dub as the base for the 1999 revision, and just forgot to switch the lines out. Well, on the flip side, maybe some kids picked up a little bit of Dutch because of this mistake. Lastly, for unused dialogue, there's only a handful of it. A few alternate takes for Sam, as well as a couple of unused lines. Four alternate takes for Blink when Sam is coming out of the anti-gravity hall. And in exchange with Wink and Blink following the brain tickler. Mom told me not to play with my food. What did that word mean that you said before? These are pretty heavy. I don't. I'd better hide the evidence. Oh, what's the use? That's the carrot who has my mask. I'm supposed to help him free the other carrots in the kitchen. Hello, Mr. Grand Champion! Hello, Mr. Grand Champion! Hello, Mr. Grand Champion! Hello, Mr. Grand Champion! Oh, hello, Mr. Grand Champion! Yes, hello, Mr. Grand Champion! Call me Sam. All right, Sam it is! Hello, Sam! The game was first shown at the 1996 E3 Expo, where it presumably went over well. And when Sam ventured into the Land of Darkness on August 6, 1996, he was greeted with a fond reception. The game was greatly acclaimed, with critics praising its plot, animation, gameplay, and the title character and it went on to be a huge sales success, selling a lifetime total of nearly 3 million units. So, with that kind of success, a follow-up was a no-brainer. Two years later, 
Sam would travel up through the clouds for his next adventure. Thunder and lightning aren't so frightening. In here, while watching an episode of The Pajama Man Show, Sam gets scared by the thunder and lightning of the ensuing thunderstorm. But he has had enough of it. So, he heads up to where thunder and lightning work, worldwide weather, in order to put a stop to it. When he gets there, however, he quickly sees that they're not at all what he expected them to be, and even picks up a little tidbit about why storms are important. Seems straightforward enough, but then he trips and accidentally hits a big red button that for some reason they have installed on the main console, and causes all of the weather around the world to go haywire. So, Sam agrees to help get all the machines back in working order and restore the weather to normal. Thus, he goes all around the factory and does and gets what he needs in order to get the missing parts back. This is a great way to expand an in-game universe and is another solid game. The team did a great job expanding upon said in-game universe while keeping the core elements of what made the first game work, as well as continuing the theme of everything and everyone is not what one expected. In this case, showing that Thunder and Lightning themselves are factory employees and working to keep the weather in check. The plot, while similar to the first one, changes just enough things up to make it a different playing experience, with Sam needing to retrieve and return the four weather machine parts to their respective machines, and it does a great job at randomizing them. The ending does have a bit of tension with Mother Nature's arrival, though like several other games, players can take as long as they need and still get it done in time regardless of how long they actually take. There's also plenty of good humor for both kids and adults, and it can sometimes get rather clever. Seriously, they had to be clever to explain what inflation and difference paradox is to kids in a way they would understand. Do you know the answer to this? Whoa, Giffen's Paradox. That's where if you take a product that's not very good and you just make it cost more money, people will buy more of it. Pretty scary, huh? That there exemplifies how much the team and the company as a whole respected kids' intelligence. The overall tone and atmosphere is the complete opposite of the Land of Darkness, as it's much brighter and more colorful, and the backgrounds do a great job at capturing the feel of an office work environment. The game, once more, has a good amount of relatability. I'm sure many of us as kids have been frightened by thunderstorms, especially ones with a lot of thunder and lightning, and adults will definitely get behind a lot of the office humor. Hello, Complaints Department, Sheila speaking, even though I'm starting to get hoarse from having to talk on the phone all day. My next door neighbor plays his stereo so loud it's curdling the milk in my refrigerator and all my cats are scared to come home. Thank you for calling the complaints department. They also did a nice job on expanding Pajama Man by showing that in universe, he wasn't just a comic book character, he's a whole franchise. While also cleverly having one path with the Snowflake Inspector draw parallels to the episode Sam was watching on television at the start of the game. For the gameplay, it got very interesting, as this is the first of two games in the series where players can select what game paths they want to play, or just let the game randomize like usual. This truly ups the variety and replayability. The side quest in this one is getting the pieces of Sam's jigsaw puzzle, and putting the whole thing together. It's much simpler than the previous one, but it's still enjoyable to do. The team got very creative with the central location, playing around with the idea of a weather factory, how the various rooms and machines create all the types of weather, and the kind of jobs and positions it would have. There are also some nice callbacks to the first game, with the character portraits around the factory and the Land of Darkness being a part of one of the minigames. Speaking of, 
the game has eight of them in total, some of which are just for fun, while others are essential for completing a path. One of the more notable minigames is a side one called The Weatherboard. It's basically sorry, where the player has to get their four pieces back to their home before their opponents do. They can get rather monotonous, especially when it comes to the final spin or your pieces getting sent back to the start, but it's still plenty of fun. As for the animation, it did receive a quality boost, as the movements are much smoother and bouncier, and the character designs, particularly the worldwide weather employees, have some very creative looks, and also some fun personalities to boot. All told, as I've already said, you've got yourself another good game in the series. So, before we continue, I feel that I should briefly talk about Sockworks. Now, I brought this up during the prologue, but that game does have a connection with this game, as the final bit at the end of the former leads into the events of the latter. That's pretty cool how the crew inserted it to connect the two games. Now, I'd be crazy if I didn't bring up that this game is home to another one of Humongous's well-known hidden easter eggs. Just like the Eddie Eats Luther bit, it was done by an animator blowing off some steam. In this case, it was animator Giancarlo Vopé. Oh, but there's more. There was also an unfinished cutscene where Sam tries to sneak in by presenting Bill Gate an employee ID card. There was no animation done, but the dialogue was in place. It was probably best that it didn't make it, given that there's no way for the player to get back out of the gate anyway. Will you let me in now? No. There's also a truckload of unused dialogue. Strap yourselves in, because this is gonna be a long haul. To start with, there was dialogue for the ending of the Pajama Man show scene at the beginning. It's not clear how they would have been used, but it was likely to have been either ambient noise or was part of a scrapped click point. Are you alright, Milkman? Yeah, but for a minute there, I thought I was going to have to change my name to Milkshake Man. Ha 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 ha! Well, it looks like the world is safe once again! Yes. But for how long? With groups like foul weathermen around, can we ever truly be safe? The road of virtue is paved with gravel. We superheroes must wear the shoes of commitment. <laughs> nice analogy, Pajama Man. Look, Earthquaker is getting okay. Somebody do something. Why, this looks like a job for Pajama Man. Next, there was a set of lines for Sam for the game setup menu. Apparently, they forgot to record one for the apply button, so they tried to compensate by splicing together different voice clips. And you can hear why they ultimately chose to leave the lines out. But they can be reactivated by running this code. Play this one. Play one of these. Let the computer choose. Apply. Now, here are some very fascinating clips. See, during the game's development, the character of Jay Langston III was originally named Jay Langston Popsicle III, but he would sometimes be called just Popsicle. However, someone on the development team found out that Popsicle was a trademark of the Unilever supply chain, so they had to shorten his name. But there was just one problem. All of the dialogue had already been recorded, so to work around it, they carefully edited out the word or omitted several lines of dialogue. Boy, talk about dodging a bullet there! 
I'm J. Langston Popsicle the third. I'm J. Langston Popsicle the third. Poor Mr. Popsicle is swamped without you. Popsicle? Mr. No Talent Take All the Credit Employee of the Month. Every month, Popsicle can go melt. For all I care, it'll even be nice to see that insensitive boob J. Langston Popsicle. Jersey Langston Popsicle the third. Birth date, 818. Favorite food, sushi. Favorite color, periwinkle. I think he and Mr. Popsicle are going to get along just fine now. There's a set of generic wines that were meant as stand-ins for when Sam fixed the weather machines. You fixed a machine. That's right, I sure did. Why is the weather such a mess? Everything's gone crazy. I'll fix the last machine. One for when Sam completes the locker puzzle while having an apple or apple core in the inventory, which wouldn't have worked given players have to give George someone an apple in order to get the combination. I really thought I was going to need this to open the lock. One for when the player tries to give George someone a second apple, which would have been impossible since the player can only get one apple. He seems happy with the one he has already. An unused lead-in for when Sam suggests it would be better to use a computer to check all of the snowflakes. I was thinking... Yes? An alternate take for Sam and the snowflake inspector about the dust devil. What is this thing anyway? It's a dust devil! Like a little bitty tornado. And one for the chairman of the board suggesting the washroom's new color. Topaz? When Sam entered worldwide weather on October 2nd, 1998, he got the entire situation under control. The game was another great sales success, and critics were once more giving it good praise. Though not as much as the first game, saying that they enjoyed the adventure and characters while also giving praise for the animation, the challenging puzzles, and its underlying message. Moving ahead another two years, Sam would be taken to another exotic location in You Are What You Eat From Your Head To Your Feet. In this one, after eating a lot of cookies for some box tops, and a few of them somehow escaping to the pantry, Sam ends up getting taken to the island of Mop Top where he quickly stumbles into a political party. Emphasis on party. Only to then get thrown in jail for not wanting to spoil his dinner. Yeah, seriously. It's almost my dinner time and I wouldn't want to spoil it. My mom made all that broccoli? <gasps> and his new friend Florette out of jail, he goes to the food pyramid and soon learns from Carrot that they are currently on the brink of war with the Swedes. That is, unless they can get the peace conference underway. The only problem? Not all of the delegates have arrived yet. Thus, Pajama Sam has to help get the remaining delegates to the conference so they can settle their differences and make peace. Now, before I get into the plot and gameplay, let me just say this right out of the gate, this game's premise is really clever. I mean, taking the typical moral about good and balanced eating and mixing it with a political theme. In many other animated projects, whenever one tries adding in a political theme or undertone, it can be rather hit or miss since it depends on how it's integrated and executed. In the case of Pajama Sam 3, the humongous team didn't just make it work, they did it in a way that made sense. It's not that overly political, and it really just serves as the springboard for the main conflict, which it does pretty well. The game did a great job at taking advantage of and having fun with its central location showing how everything functions, setting up the main conflict, and what has to be done. The plot is definitely a good one, since, again, not a whole lot of kids' games would execute the moral in this manner. 
and it actually makes the game more mature. Unlike the first two games, the relatability doesn't come from a childhood fear, but rather another common scenario, having too many sweets. I mean, we've all eaten a lot of sweets on Sundays and needed to balance it out with healthier meals, so it's a somewhat clever way of getting it across. Sam's speech at the end, though a bit cheesy, is quite poignant, and does a great job at not talking down to kids. Also, it makes one wish many actual peace conferences went over as well as this one did. All the best things to eat are made by different kinds of food working together. And that's what you should all be doing. Instead of fighting, you can work together to create new and better things. The gameplay once more has you rescuing important characters and giving different ways to rescue them, as this is the second game that lets players select which paths they want to do. This time, however, the stakes here are higher than they were in the first two games. I mean, there's a looming threat of war going on. That right there should say enough, despite said war never actually happening. The collectibles this time around are the box tops. If one gets all 20, they will get the Pajama Man action figure Sam was talking about at the beginning. The catch though is that the first two are in the two areas you can't backtrack to, and if one doesn't get them, it renders it impossible to get them all in one playthrough, which helps add to the replayability. The central location, the Isle of Mop Top, is one of the most creative locations the series has done yet, and the crew truly got imaginative with the areas, having each of them reflect a different part of the body, though some of the names are a bit on the nose, and what roles the full characters play in how it functions. Speaking of, the new characters are very charming, colorful, fun, and memorable and it's always good seeing Carrot make another return in a scenario that fits him perfectly. It's also got a great amount of humorous moments. What? I said guard, not gourd! Great goulash! Aldous used to ask me, what's small and red and goes 60 miles an hour? Anyone? Huh? Huh? It's a strawberry driving a car. <laughs> If there are some criticisms with the game, it would have to be with the pacing. Now, I'm not talking about how long it takes to rescue each delegate. That's all fine. I mean some of the timed puzzles and minigames, shelf scramble, and the bean counting and sorting machine to be more specific. Don't get me wrong, they are both fun to play and are necessary for finishing one game path. But they become unintentionally tedious since it'll sometimes take a long while to finish either one, but they don't detract from the game too much. Then there's the Ski minigame. It's not terrible at all, but it's too simplistic, as all you do is pick which route to go upon coming to a junction. It feels like a watered-down version of the race from Putt-Putt enters the race. I will say though, the decision to have it played and presented from a first-person perspective was a pretty cool touch. Also, it is a bit dated, as the food pyramid has long since been supplanted as the standard nutritional guideline. Other than those bits, this is another solid entry in the series. Alright, you've waited long enough for this, so let's get this obvious little bit out of the way. Um, look, a sweet potato! Where is that? I don't see anybody. Oh, hello, sir. Welcome to the egg complex, Mr. Uh, uh Gord. I'm Gord. Mr. Gord, very good. Yes, it's a nod to the original Pumpkinhead Boy which once again exemplifies the care the humongous crew had when putting the games together. Not too many unused scenes in this one, but there is one fascinating easter egg. At one point, the Sweet Troopers were sporting riot gear. What was up with that, you may be asking? Well, 
This was a reference to the Seattle WTO protests that had occurred during the game's production. Like in the last game, there is a plethora of unused dialogue, consisting of... Ugh, licorice. Blech. Licorice. Licorice again? Rats, more licorice. Yuck. Licorice. Yikes. I'm not putting my hand near that again. I can't use that here. I'm not going anywhere near them. Okay, Florette's finally... <clears throat> well, they better get here soon, or you know what that means. Exactly. Let's do some more sailing, Sprinkle. Colorful. I don't want to interrupt his counting. All right. I've already found Bean 47. It looks like a turtle, but I think it's a walnut. They're like little stepping stones. That one's pretty far away. I don't think I can jump that far. I'll never make it. That's too far for me to jump. I'm Sam. These hats are actually kind of nice. Yeah, all we've got to do now is use it to find bean number 47. Well, all we've got to do now is to use the bean counting machine to number the beans at least as far as 47. And we're home free. Oh, I can't tell you how happy I am that the bean counting machine is finally put together. I'm sure bean number 47 will be pleased. I think I looked better in the last one. I doubt if hitting it harder will make it work any better. I don't want to break the button. I guess. Plungers work better on drains and stuff. I need to click on those lifts to go up and down. I've got to click on the lift to ride it. These shapes look like the ones on the map. They show the route that the plumber took when he went skiing. That might work, but I'd probably better use real skis. She is not the cream puff. She is the pastry. <laughs> How little you know, my friend. <laughs> How little you know, my friend. <laughs> 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 And finally, a set of separate individual recordings of each of the delegates chanting and some original whole recordings. Last but not least, there are four unused music cues, consisting of a bass-driven track, a track similar to the one used in the heart junction, an isolated version of the cue used as the second half of the ending music, a surf remix of the main theme that would later be used in games to play on any day, and a guitar bass piece. When the Peace Conference finally got underway on February 1st, 2000, it managed to go over better than expected. Critics were giving the game great praise for its humor, replayability, Sam's optimistic outlook, and for respecting the audience's intelligence, and even said that it was impressively complex. So with all that, Surprise, surprise, it went on to become another sales success. A year later, Sam would have a more unique entry with games to play on any day. There's really not a whole lot to say about it. It's just a minigame compilation in the same veins as the activity packs and the junior arcades. So, why bring it up at all? Couple of reasons. See, until its release on Steam, this was the rarest humongous entertainment game out there. Because it had such a very limited run, it immediately fell into obscurity. So for a long time, it was hard to find a physical copy. The game would also mark the final time Pamela Adlin would reprise Sam, which we'll get into later. All that being said, this is a good minigame set, with some very fun and occasionally challenging ones. 
It's also neat seeing the various pajama sand twists on many of these classic board games. Like Four Cheese Pizza is a simplified take on Trivial Pursuit, Rob Pile is essentially Mancala, Goody Goody Gontrop is Reversi, and of course, you knew they bring back cheese and crackers for this game. There's not a whole lot of unused elements for this one, it's mostly just unused responses for games that ended in a tie, alternate takes and unused lines for Florette in Jumping Beans, and one for Darkness in Cheese and Crackers. One interesting note about it, the game was originally titled Pajama Sam's Games to Play on a Rainy Day, but marketing didn't like it and had it changed to its final title. I guess they thought the original title sounded too depressing and wanted it to sound more appealing to all players, even though the former was spinning given it does take place on a rainy day. Another notable bit? If you listen carefully, Sam in this one has a bit of a drawl, and this is also the first humongous game to have the audio rendered in 22 kilohertz as opposed to 11 kilohertz. They even rendered the music from 3 in it, and it sounds really good. Now, where are those board games? I think they're in this closet. Rats! My favorite game is on the top shelf! Two years later, Sam would be heading off to the mall for his last adventure in Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff. In here, Sam hears that Pajama Man will be at the mall signing autographs for one day, and he naturally gets all excited about it. So he goes to his room to get his favorite comic book for him to sign, the rare first issue of Pajama Man. However, it ends up getting pulled down into the land of junk. Upon arriving, Sam quickly learns it was taken to the Grubby Corners Mall so it could be signed by Dr. Grime. But there's one catch. The mall has a strict dress code and he can only go in if he has a shirt, socks, and shoes. Thus, Sam needs to go across the land of junk, get the needed clothes so he can get into the mall and retrieve his comic book before Dr. Grime touches it and makes it filthy forever. At this moment, you're probably thinking, this sounds a lot like the plots of Pajama Sam's Lost and Found and Freddy Fish 4. While they are similar to an extent, Life is Rough does play it out differently, with Sam needing to get back one item instead of a whole bunch of them, and it doesn't require Sam to disguise himself, but instead, get mistaken for someone else. The overall plot and scenario is a good fit for a Pajama Sam game, as it's one you would expect the series to do at some point, because it's two relatable childhood things combined. I mean, as kids, it's always a dream getting to meet your all-time favorite actors or characters in person and asking for their autographs. Plus, Losing your favorite and most treasured possession is definitely something everyone, especially collectors, can attest to. However, as much relatability and potential the game has, in execution, it unfortunately comes out as easily the worst entry of the entire series. To start with, the plot itself is far too simple with not too much happening, and as a result, 
it just kind of meanders about until the player gets a new item or reaches the next area. It doesn't help either that the characters here are very one note and don't have any interesting personalities. Not to mention some really weak humor. Some days it rains. Them days is nice too. I have to put on my wrapper then, but rain is nice. Ah, oh, the peanut. The misunderstood nut. The gameplay here feels very watered down in contrast with the first three, as it only follows one path to get each article of clothing, and it has no interchangeability apart from where the jar is at. Sure, one can change up the order they do them in, but it doesn't change the fact it's less replayable than the others. There's also some odd sequencing, like the bishop won't poke holes in the jar until after you try to catch the fireflies first, or the happy farmer not showing up until after you first visit grubby corners. For comparison, in the first game, one can get the wooden boar before they go and meet Otto. Also, for whatever reason, it has a musical number. Now, on its own, it's not a bad song, but it feels out of place and the moment didn't necessarily call for one. Plus, there aren't any other numbers in the whole game, making it even more pointless. The minigames and puzzles in here are a lot simpler and easier than before, and again, don't have much replayability. Seriously. The scaling drawers and clearing trash minigames are so easy, they're not worth playing again. Plus, the latter is just a copy of Bejeweled. The Land of Junk is an interesting location, as it does a good job at reflecting Sam's messy room, with the various stuff scattered about the world, and having bits of carpeting popping out of the ground is a nice detail but the overall aesthetic is just emulating the Land of Darkness, right down to having it being set in a nighttime environment. Not sure why they decided to have this land in a nighttime setting. Also, it oddly feels smaller than the aforementioned did. The collectibles this time around are the Pajama Man trading cards, but even the side quest feels watered down. Not to say that the cars themselves are bad or anything, they are well done and are definitely one of the better aspects of the game. The problem is, they're on every screen of the game except for at the beginning and the dressing room. Sure, it changes up what card is in what location, but even still, it takes away a lot of the fun and challenge of trying to find them. This could have easily been remedied by also changing up what cards you find. Also, the music cue for it can get really tiresome very fast. The character animation in here really took a big downgrade. It's not as bouncy and lively as it was before, and you can tell where they cut a lot of corners. In fact, there are spots like this where you can see it switching from the new animations to the old ones and vice versa. It doesn't help either that the clip points aren't as fun and imaginative as they were before. Now, I know I'm being very hard on this game, but like with Pet's birthday surprise, the crew can't be blamed too much for the final result, as they were trying to do their best with the budget and resources they had. However, what I just said there was only the tip of the iceberg. What exactly do I mean by that? Well, if you'll recall back in the prologue, I talked about how, when GT Interactive became Infogrom's Inc., Humongous was subjected to a lot more executive interference and resistance. But what I didn't elaborate on was just how bad said interference and resistance was making things for them. See, by this time, Infogrom's Inc., now Atari Inc., decided they didn't want to continue making any more of the adventure games, since it's no secret that making 2D animated games was anything but cheap. Yes, Humongous' games were still very popular with kids, parents, and critics, but the games themselves, while still selling well, only ever turned in small profits, but they added up over time. However, 
Atari Inc. wasn't interested in making games that only made small profits. Instead, they wanted big games that would, in turn, make huge profits. Which was probably the main reason why Backyard Sports was allowed to continue. The problem with that was, doing those kinds of games were a huge risk. By contrast, when they were under GT Interactive, as I said at the start, GT had a more laissez-faire approach and allowed Humongous to still run operations their way. However, Atari Inc. did eventually allow the team to make more of them, but on one condition. They'd let them do it if they kept the costs on them down. So, they asked the crew to plan them out as well as present how much it was going to take, which they acquiesced to. But the team strongly advised against making them, because they felt they cut too many corners. But Atari Inc. said to make them anyway. So the crew tried to do the best they could, as they really loved the characters and wanted them to turn out good. But it proved to not be easy. Why? Well, for starters, there was almost no storyboarding phase, which was where a good amount of the creativity and editing was done. They also had to outsource a good amount of the art to another company, which proved to be very hard on the artists, who were also doing all of the keyframing that were then given over, and they'd get back animations that were charitably described as subpar. Not to mention, they had to fix up the incoming art and manage the outsourcing companies in addition to their own work. As you can imagine, because of their tireless devotion, they were put in a time crunch and had to work unpaid overtime, which ended up leaving them with not enough time to put in more creativity. Now, some of you may be asking, okay, that explains why the games look so much cheaper, but why did they switch to using a new game engine instead of sticking with the Scum engine for this and Pep's birthday surprise like before? Well, for that, you once again have Atari Inc. to thank for that. They insisted that the crew switch from using the Scum engine to using the industry standard technology to make the games. As a result, they were written in a new game engine called the Python, later dubbed the Yaga. Now granted, the team would have had to upgrade the game engine anyway, since by 2003, the Scum engine had become outdated. Heck. LucasArts stopped using it back in 1997, but if they had it their way, they would have taken the time to first learn the ins and outs of what it could do. But that didn't happen. Because they were starting from scratch with a new engine, the crew was literally figuring out how to use it as they were making the games. This meant there were elements they didn't have time to implement. This is why, for instance, one couldn't completely change Pup Putt's color in Pep's birthday surprise. It was both really stressful and distressing, down to the point where the team felt they weren't reaching the quality they had set for themselves. It's pretty sad to hear all this happen. No game's production or crew deserves to go through that kind of stressful pressure. So, getting back to the game, like with Pep's birthday surprise, due to Humongous' then current financial state and working with a smaller budget, they weren't able to get Pamela Adlin back again, so Sam was recast to Alicia Ferguson, who, like Michelle Thorson before, I'm certain gave it her best shot, but her performance was really lackluster, and it sounded like she was trying too hard to sound like a young boy. However, this wouldn't be the first time Adlin didn't come back to reprise the role. That honor would actually go to Pajama Sam Sockworks. Adlin, at the time the game was in production, was busy off doing other projects, including but not limited to Pepper Ann, Recess, and especially King of the Hill. So, for Sockworks, they brought on another veteran voice actress to fill in for her, E.G. Daly and she actually did a great job playing the character. I can't sleep with darkness hanging around in my closet. I'm gonna have to capture him. This is a job for... Pajama Sam! Aha! 
All right, cookies. Your dinner-spoiling days are over. But Jim and Sam is on his way. That was a great dream. But I better get to work on those socks now. Mom said to have them done before school. Hey, it's snowing like crazy out there. Yes, school will be closed for sure. Oh, well, why don't you come along with me? Maybe I can help get you and the other sock back together. Do you really mean that? Pajama Sam is on the job. Are we there yet? We're here! Inside the Grubby Corners Mall! Now, what the final game lacks in content and replayability, it certainly makes up for with the amount of unused elements. First off, there were a few areas that were planned but ultimately got cut out of the final game. These include an interior area of the aquarium, a lamp court area, and a side tabletop, which would have also included a new character, the Roman soldier. That would have been linked with the aquarium and could be reached by jumping off the cliff where the fireflies were, which in the final game takes you directly to the aquarium instead, and a separate area for the chest bleachers. There are also other interesting unused elements and early ideas, like Dr. Grime was originally named Dr. Filth, and the Peanuts were to sometimes appear in the Dust Buddy Corral, which would have helped add to the game's replayability. For unused music, there's a cue intended for the aquarium's interior that didn't make it due to that area getting cut out. Oh, and while I'm still on about music, you know the song The Soiled Socks sang at the beginning? Well, there was going to be a reprise of it for when the two socks are happily reunited. It was written, but was cut out of the final game, making it even weirder the first song was kept in. As for unused dialogue, there were some early recordings for the soiled sock that suggest the character was originally female. Hi, Sam. Well, now that you mention it, no, it's a sad situation. I suppose the best way to explain it is this. Now do you understand my position? Right. Now you're starting to think like a sock. And some from Grandma's sweater about losing her contact lens, which was part of an alternate game path where you would have had to use a static balloon in order to find them that was cut due to time constraints. Tarnation! My contact lens! Did you see where it went? Be really careful where you step. If you hear a crunching sound, that's bad. When Sam hit the Grubby Corners Mall on August 19, 2003, along with Pup Pup Pep's birthday surprise, it was anything but a pleasant sight. With critics, they generally gave it good reviews, mostly calling it a basic and fun children's educational game. When it came to the fans though, they absolutely loathed it! decrying it for its lackluster adventure, lower effort, and Ferguson's performance as Sam. Some have even went as far as to call it not just the worst Pajama Sam game, but also one of, if not the worst game Humongous ever made. So it should go without saying that it did not sell very well. After that, the games coasted along with reissues for the rest of the aughts, until there were eventual releases on Steam, the iOS, Switch, and the App Store. There were a couple of ports prior to that that were attempted. Of course, there's the Wii port, which for a wide variety of reasons, did not work well at all. And there is one other fascinating port release the series ever got. The PS1 release of Pajama Sam 3. Yes, you heard it right! This was released on the original PlayStation in 2001. What's interesting about it is, they didn't just take the PC Mac version and put it on a PlayStation disc. The whole port was completely built from the ground up. The end result? Well, it left a lot to be desired. Many cutscenes and music were removed, and there's a lot of load times. Needless to say, it wasn't very good. Moving on to a more positive note, 
the series would win various awards, like an All-Star Award, a Silver Honor Parents' Choice Award, and two Review Corners Award of Excellence. Pajama Sam is the most endearing series of the Junior Adventures, thanks to its relatable title character, imaginative worlds and scenarios, memorable characters, and humor even adults will get into. Next, we journey from the world of imagination to the world of espionage, as we'll go on world-saving missions with the top spy agent. point in our story, Humongous Entertainment was on a roll. They were coming up with new games like Clockwork, and 1997 would prove to be a busier year than 96, and for two good reasons. That year marked the company's fifth anniversary in business, and it also saw the debut of three different new series. One was an educational duology, Big Thinkers, that was their attempt to get in on the preschool-kindergarten market cornered by PlaySchool and Jumpstart. The second was a baseball game that would later become another big series, Backyard Baseball. And the third, and also the first of the three, would be their fourth and final new junior adventure series, Spy Fox. The series is about Agent Spy Fox, the top spy agent of the Spy Corps agency. He is assigned various missions to save the world from criminal masterminds, be they stopping a rampaging dog bot, a worldwide milk shortage, or preventing the entire ozone layer from being depleted. However, he's not alone on them. With the help of Monkey Penny and Professor Quack, he gets the information and spy gadgets he needs in order to complete each mission and save the world from evil. Now, just a quick heads up, the production history portion of this video is going to be shorter than the others. Now, this wasn't from a lack of doing the research. I casted a wide search looking high and low for whatever information I could find, and was only able to find a handful of it. However, that doesn't mean it won't be any less interesting. Anyways, the idea for Spy Fox all began one day at a gym, when Brad Carlton and the late Brett Barrett were doing an improv to brainstorming session. As they were both big fans of the spy genre, it was naturally a match made in heaven, and it was a genre humongous hadn't done yet. So they went ahead and pitched their idea, and the company gave it the green light to make it their next adventure game. When the game first began development, the first aspect the team worked on was what sort of character it should be, as they've already done a car, a fish, and a young boy. They eventually settled with having the characters be animals, which made the most sense to them, and thus the title character would be named Sly Fox. However, since that name was already taken, at the suggestion of one person on the marketing team, they changed it to its final title, which everyone liked. Though the first name would have been fitting, they made the right call changing it, since it gave the character a bit more distinction. For the overall design and animation of the games, you may have noticed that it looks a lot more graphic and stylized compared to the other three, like something you would find on Cartoon Network around this time. That's because the team took inspiration from various animated properties with a similar style, including Rocky and Bullwinkle, the cartoons of United Productions of America, or UPA, and legendary Looney Tunes background artist and Chuck Jones collaborator Maurice Noble. Interestingly, even though the series is well known for making a lot of references to James Bond, believe it or not, 007 was not what inspired the character. Instead, the actual source of inspiration came from another spy agent, the classic 1964 spy comedy series, Get Smart. 
they even threw in a few references and catchphrases from that show, and would you believe they based Spy Fox's original voice off of the main character, Maxwell Smart. The laser toothbrush makes impervious steel doors pervious. Would you believe me if I told you that I had my own television show on public access called Entering the Wax Museum? On a side note, the preview featured in Freddy Fish 2 showed some of the other early ideas. Like Spy Fox's fur was initially brown, and his car, the Asti Spumoni, was going to be black instead of white. Both of which were changed up for the final game. Once everything was set up, it went through Humongous' usual production process, and thus the first Spy Fox game was born. Well, let's not waste any more time. Let's get to work on cracking these three cases. Starting off with dry cereal, a worldwide dairy shortage is occurring, all thanks to the ruthless mastermind, William the Kid, who plans to replace all of the dairy milk byproducts with goat byproducts. Yuck! Meanwhile, Spy Fox is called in by Monkey Penny to rendezvous on the island of Acidopolis. His mission? To locate Kid's secret fortress, disarm the milky weapon of destruction, free the cows, and capture William the Kid. But, he's gotta look for clues and use the right spy gadgets in order to find said secret fortress and put an end to Kid's evil plan. As the one to start off the series, it started off strong. It does a great job at establishing the world, characters, central location, tone, and the main conflict. It's a typical spy mission plot, but it puts an interesting and humorous spin on it. With there being a dairy drought, the main villain kidnapping dairy cows and framing them for the crime, while also plotting to take over the whole dairy industry. Like many of their other games, the gameplay has the player going around town, searching for clues, gathering up the necessary items, and rustling up spy gadgets in order to progress but it adds an additional spin to make the gameplay feel different from the others, and that's with the talk balloons. Whenever an item or a specific piece of information needs to be obtained, the player can have Spy Fox use them to ask the locals a specific question, and the responses widely vary. Sometimes, they'll provide the player and Spy Fox with some needed information or items, while others give hints as to where you're actually supposed to go. The puzzles in here are more challenging than in the other three series, and require plenty of timing, memorizing, and of course, creative problem and puzzle solving. The team also did a great job at keeping players guessing what items they'll need and what path they're going to get. There's also a couple of fun minigames, one of which is a little shooter minigame called Happy Fun Sub. This game and the series as a whole is very humorous, with some good jokes and moments, some witty one-liners, and as stated before, plenty of James Bond and Get Smart references. Not to mention a plethora of puns, though that last one depends on how much one tolerates that kind of wordplay. This was probably a nice place, until someone came along and ruined it. Hmm, I guess you can teach old dogs new tricks. That thing is not only giving me the eye, it gave me the boot. Tanks, but no tanks. There are also some clever ones sprinkled in there. Like Acidopolis is actually the name of the bacteria that changes milk into yogurt. The game's cast of characters are an amusing bunch with some colorful and memorable personalities, though some of them are a bit one-note, and the island itself is a very unique location, and the crew did a good job at capturing some of the Greek vibe in some of the backgrounds. For the animation and overall look, while it is a departure from the other series, it does make it more unique and stand out, with the use of thick black outlines, a more angular design, and the character animation complements it, 
It's very snappy, but also smooth, and it can have some zany moments. You think they would? <laughs> Another aspect the series has going for it is having good and bad endings. The latter happens when the player either waits too long or decides not to go after the villain. Sure, they'll still get a reward in the end, but it'll be a lesser one. However, if they do choose to give chase, they'll get the real ending where the villain is captured and are given a bigger reward. Now, if there is one element that this game is most infamous for, aside from the puns and references, it'd be the game of Go Fish. Now, for what it's worth, it is a fun but rather challenging minigame that does require a good amount of strategic thinking and memorizing, and is also based on luck. So where does its infamy come from? Well, it comes from its involvement on one of the paths. See, on the car path, it is completely optional, but the player can play it for fun if they chose to. However, it's a whole different story on the Whitewater Path. In order to get to the secret fortress on that one, Spy Fox has to go out on the ocean, but he can't do that until he gets Captain Drydock's Lucky Charm back, and to get it back, he has to play Go Fish against Mr. Big Pig, and how the game plays out varies. Sometimes, the player might luck out and win on the first, second, or third try, but more times than not, they'll end up playing it 10 or even 15 times before they finally score victory, which can get really frustrating and make some players dread about getting the path. On a side note, I have to say that Bob Zank did a great job playing Spy Fox. He gave the character that cool, suave, and witty smart ass charm. Impressive. Disguising it as a half-buried boat in the middle of the town square was a stroke of genius. Nobody would ever notice that. So, all told, you got yourself a very solid game and, once again, a great start to the series. Now, here's a little trivia note. The waltz music heard at the deck party and in the cantina is a rendition of the cue used in Sam's room from Pajama Sam 1. Now, before we get into the unused elements, I want to briefly touch upon a rather interesting tidbit about Dry Cereal. See, when Infogrons re-released the game in 2003, they somehow got a hold of the British dub and accidentally released it in America. This likely led to a bit of confusion for some players as to why the characters suddenly sound differently, particularly Spy Fox. As in that version, he sounded more like Bond than smart. Hmm, so this is the sleepy little Greek island of Acidophilus. I seem to have arrived unfashionably early, since nothing seems to be open. Hmm, so this is the sleepy little Greek island of Acidophilus. I seem to have arrived unfashionably early, as nothing seems to be open. So, getting into the unused elements, the game has some rather intriguing ones, like a slip of paper that had the Spy Jail's coordinates, which suggests it was originally written down before it was supplanted by the Spy Watch display, or was meant to be used on the autopilot instead of just punching in the coordinates. Here's where the bad guys go, jail. Also, the code used to enter Kid's secret fortress was initially a talk balloon, as the original idea for it was probably for Spy Fox to ask the townsfolk about it, which wouldn't have been possible to do. Fascinatingly, there were some unused graphics for the Happy Fun Sub minigame, including two pages of sprites that were originally part of a How to Play tutorial, plan power-ups for the spy ship, and even an armored version of it for each mode, 
which would have made the minigame much more interesting to play. Also, there is some unused animation of Johnny Gecko debating whether or not to accept Spy Fox's offer to trade music sheets. Not a lot of unused music cues here, but they are interesting, including two cues that are not known where they were meant to go, and one of which was later used in Cheese Chase. A cue likely intended for Kit's Fortress, and the full version of the cue heard when Spybox attempts to swim past the guards and they give chase. Lastly, there is a plethora of unused dialogue like various bits for Captain Dry Dog and Mr. Big Pig, exchanges between Spy Fox and Monkey Penny, two involving the Chicken Knuckles, an exchange about B giving lessons on cockadoodle foo and many others. Can I get another oh, order please, of Chicken Knuckles, God. please? It's a bottomless bucket, honey. I think you still have plenty. Ready for another bon voyage? Come aboard. Do you know if B gives lessons in cockadoodle foo? Sir, please stop wasting your time talking to me and go talk to B. Monkey Penny, can you hack into the local video store's database to see what William the Kid's favorite movies are? I've already thought of that. Kid's favorite movies are The Goat Father, Invasion of the Cow Snatchers, Goat Busters, and La Dolce Feta. When Spy Fox began his mission on September 2nd, 1997, it ended up a great success. Critics gave the game some good reviews, and it did very well, selling more than 2 million units over its lifetime. The next year would see the release of the series' first junior arcade, Cheese Chase. Now, before I continue, let me just say that I know I've sparsely talked about them in the other videos. Well, that's because, plot-wise, there's not a lot that could be said about them. Plus, I already talked about the unused elements in the prologue. However, there are a few exceptions, like Sockworks, as I brought up in the Pajama Sam video, and it's the same case here. Anyways, the game acts as a sort of direct follow-up to Dry Cereal, where Russian Blue steals the prized Limburger cheese and Spy Fox gives chase to get it back and capture Russian Blue, while also dealing with her thugs and other various obstacles. A couple of notable attributes it has are, the cutscenes are presented in a small widescreen frame, and with the four different terrains the player goes across, they occur every 10 levels, and Spy Fox changes up his vehicle to accommodate them. Later, on the last 20, it changes up every 5 levels. This is also the only game in the series where Monkey Penny doesn't appear at all. Fast forward one year, and Spy Fox would get his next mission in some assembly required. In here, after retrieving a mysterious trash bag containing a model box for an evil dog bot, Spy Fox is sent off to the World's Fair to investigate what's happening, and soon learns that the villain, Napoleon LaRoche, has reversed the scale and has created a gigantic evil dog bot. Once wound it up to maximum power, it will embark on a violent rampage. The mission? Deactivate the dog bot and stop the Roach's villainous worldwide rampage. So, Spy Fox must get both the off switch and its activation code in order to save both the fair and the world from La Roach's evil scheme. This might be a slight step back from the first one, but this is still an entertaining game. It does a great job at continuing to build up what the first game had established having a different way of setting up the main conflict and mission of the game right away, 
establishing the central location, and where the player is meant to go on a given game path. The team also did an amazing job of further building the series world and expanding on the lore, with the introduction of the evil group... Melly, As in the society of meaningless evil larceny lying and yelling. Of course, our evil nemesis. The gameplay this time requires Spy Fox needing to retrieve two key items to stop the Dogbot and having to get into the inner workings to do so. And the team once more did a great job at varying up the paths, as well as upping the challenge of the puzzles, as they required more creative thinking and memorizing than in the first game. It also does a good job at keeping up the series humor and continual references to Get Smart and James Bond but also throws in some to current events at the time, like with the Sheep Twins. Though, some other bids can be hit or miss. On the side, it says, Some Assembly Required. Sounds like an excellent title for one of my adventures. How polite. Obviously, you're a fox with home training. Yes, I am housebroken, thank you. Talk about escaping by the skin of your teeth. The World's Fair as a location is very lively with the numerous attractions, and having some characters and attractions only be available on a particular path is a nice touch, and it adds to the variety and replayability. The backgrounds complement it as well, as they work in giving each location and attraction a unique and standout look from one another. The minigame in this, Things From Space, is pretty fun and somewhat intense, given how it gets more challenging with each level. Also, the character designs were tweaked and refined a bit, making them look better than in the first game. Speaking of, the new characters here have some delightful, fun, and enjoyable personalities, though some may come off a bit grating, while also bringing back a couple of them from the first game in their suitable roles. The last time I ended up with a fever from being cat scratched. Right. Sorry about that. I tell you, kiddo, I did the single snow boot as the mass she bear. Napoleon LaRoche's evil plan is certainly an interesting one, with having a giant dog bark go on a gigantic rampage and having almost no way for anyone to stop it is somewhat ingenious. But his motivation is a stark contrast to the first one where William the Kid's motive was to take over the whole dairy industry, LaRoche's main motive for the rampage was... because he was too short to go on a ride he really wanted to get on, and was mocked for his height. Although it is a relatable situation, I mean, as a kid, who wasn't disappointed when they couldn't go on a particular ride, it does make LaRoche's reasons much more petty, which does make it a bit of a step down. However, that was kind of the point. After all, not every villain has to have the same driving force behind their motives. So, put all of that together, and you've got yourself a nice and solid follow-up. Okay, let's talk about the reason why Spy Fox's voice changed in between games. Well, unlike Putt-Putt and Pajama Sam, where it was for financial reasons, Spy Fox had a completely different story. At the time the game was in production, Bob Zang had moved out to Hawaii, and since it was next to impossible to remotely record the voice, Spy Fox was recast to Mike Mattioy, who actually did a good job in taking over the character. Wait a second, I recognize it now. It's the ancient hieroglyphic language of the infamous Minoan Musaka cult. No, Monkey Penny, not Smelly. Smelly, as in... The Society for Meaningless Evil Larceny Lying and Yelling. Another aspect worth addressing is this rather intriguing Easter egg. You're probably thinking right now, what on earth was up with that? Well, that bit is actually a nod to the death scene from Dragon's Lair. Thank goodness this wasn't a part of the final game, because this definitely would have scared a lot of kids. There's not a lot of unused elements in this one, 
But there is one fascinating unused graphic piece. An early concept art of Spycore's chief, where his office layout is flipped, his chair is a different model, and the top of his head can be visible. This is about the closest anyone will get to seeing what he was supposed to look like. Lastly, like with the first game, there is a lot of unused dialogue, which includes... Can you tell me anything else about an ice skating move known as the single snow boot? In times like these, I think about what the card would say. What would he say? Hand me my cape, son. Where are you at in your mission, Spy Fox? I have the activation code and the off switch, but I haven't gotten into the evil dog bot yet. I'm sure it's much easier than you think. Don't look too hard. I'll keep that in mind. Monkey Penny, out. So, where could I get a rose for Ladybug? Fox got a crush on a Ladybug. Fox got a crush on a Ladybug. When Spy Fox entered the World's Fair on October 26, 1999, he managed to get the giant dog bot to heal. Critics gave the game great praise for its ability to encourage logical thinking, the characters, and for being immensely entertaining, and even said that parents would enjoy the game's humor. So, with all of that, to no one's surprise, the game went on to be another sales success. Interestingly, earlier that year, Spy Fox was off on another junior arcade adventure in Hold the Mustard. In it, King Conglomerate, maker of fine mustards, devises a plan to have his robots steal the world's supply of tomatoes, seeing as most people prefer ketchup over mustard. His ultimate plan for getting rid of them? Blow them up in a rocket and send them into a black hole. Yeah. So, Spy Fox must knock out all the robots, get the tomatoes back, and put a stop to King Conglomerate's plan. Suffice to say, this was the most boring of all the Junior Arcades, which is really saying something. That being said, it does have some good aspects going for it. The use of cel-shaded CGI on the spy mess at the beginning was pretty cool, some of the humor was pretty funny, even now, they are stealing tomatoes in the Western Hemisphere while you sit here playing with the fishes. And now, to effect my spectacular escape. <laughs> and, in Passageway 8, if the player blasts a crate, they can play 8 additional levels, dubbed the Atlantis levels, along with getting some additional cutscenes one of which midway through reveals King Conglomerate's true self, which is carried over to the ending. Now, I brought this up during the prologue, but an interesting quirk about the game is, it was first released as part of the Junior Arcade compilation disc Super Duper Arcade 2 on September 7, 1999. Then, it later got an individual release on September 12, 2000 making it the final Junior Arcade game Humongous released. Why they decided to release it that way is anyone's guess. Jumping on ahead another two years, and the Fox would be off on his most out-of-this-world mission for his final adventure in Operation Ozone. In here, an orbiting aerosol can is spraying a seemingly endless spray of aerosol directly at the Earth's ozone layer. Who could possibly be behind this nefarious plan? Why, none other than the Queen of Cosmetics, Poodles Galore. And what's her ultimate goal for doing this? All the little darlings will scream for my sunscreen! Poodles brand SPF 2001! Really? Are you serious? Okay then, whatever floats your boat. Anyways, Spy Fox's mission? To destroy the camp before it depletes the ozone layer. Thus, he has to travel to four places around the world to get the four ingredients needed to finish the one thing that can obliterate the aerosol can, the congeal pill, and also capture Poodles galore. As far as final entries go, this was a decent way to end the series. The team once again did a great job on expanding the series' world with the various new locations Spy Fox has to go to, the different characters he interacts with, and what needs to be done in order to progress through the mission. 
there's also a neat callback to hold the mustard in the form of the Super Spy Mess. It's always nice to see little nods to the junior arcades occasionally pop up. On a more poignant note, the game's environmental theme has become more relevant now than it was back when the game was first made, as global heating has become more of a hot-button issue in recent years. Not trying to go all philosophical or political here, just making an observation. The gameplay keeps things interesting by having to globetrot to four different areas as opposed to keeping it all in one location like the first two games did. And once more, the backgrounds do a great job at giving each location a different vibe and feel. The puzzles here are among the most challenging ones yet, requiring plenty of memorizing, strategizing, and creative problem solving. The minigame for this one is called Radioactive Trash Collector, where you have to collect all the germs and junk on screen. It's rather basic as you only have to aim the crosshairs at the objects or use a smart bomb when you collect it in the bonus round, but it's still a decently fun top-down shooter game. Also, there's the bowling minigame, which is about as simple as one can get, but it's still fun regardless. One other thing they did to spice it up was having the player need to use two or more spy gadgets, and requiring them to backtrack to the command center to get more, thus helping add to the challenge. It's also cool that Monkey Penny gets to be a part of the action for the first and only time in the series. Not so fast, poodles. The game does a decent job at taking advantage of the glow trotting aspect, though it could have gone much further with it, which leads us into some of the flaws. Now, as I already said, the minigames are really simple and basic, to the point where they become too easy. Not to mention, some of the jokes can be very groan-worthy. You're looking sharp, Pins. Now I'm really on a roll. Roger Bohr. Wow, you had me wigged out there for a second. Also, the new characters in this are a mixed bag. There are some that have weird and fun personalities, but others are very one-note and can get somewhat grating. Another flaw it has would be the villain's goal and motivation. Now, this is not to say that Poodle's goal herself was bad or anything. On the contrary, she's a very fun and amusing villainess, kinda has a Cruella de Vil vibe going for her, and it's good that they chose not to go with another world domination plot as they already did that in the last game. But she probably has the flimsiest motivation of the three villains. I mean, she wants to destroy the ozone layer just to get people to buy her brand of sunscreen, when there are much easier methods to accomplish that without putting the entire planet in danger. Other than those bits, this is a fun entry, and again, a decent one for the series to stop at. Okay, now's as good a time as any to mention one of the most peculiar easter eggs Humongous ever slipped in. <laughs> yes, it's clearly meant to be just a throwaway bit, but even still, it's a really weird one. For unused elements, just like the last game, it doesn't have a whole lot of them. It's mostly just unused dialogue, including bits like... I can't get through the quicksand that way. I'd better make use of the grappling granny spy gadget again. I think the color of that bowling shirt would work better for me. I'm sure it would, but you have to trade back the other shirt first. That's a mullet-style wig. Trey chic. There isn't a pearl here. I should keep looking. Again, though there's not a whole lot from the main game, it does have one fascinating unused piece that was left over. A teaser for a then-upcoming game called A Gas Pocket Adventure. Aliens Ate My Cookies, 
which was going to be Humongous Entertainment's first ever pre-rendered CGI adventure game. Now, to give a quick rundown on it, the game was going to be about a girl named Miss Half, though in the demo she's named Jessie Sparks, who is tasked with taking six rare photos for Dr. Crabcracker, while also trying to stop Patrick Finkwater from feeding aliens cookies that make them rapidly multiply and causing a lot of trouble. This sounds like it was right up Humongous' alley and it could have been a fun adventure game and also would have been nice to have a new female protagonist. It was slated to be released later in the fall of that year, but it was ultimately cancelled because the Infogrom's executives thought a game with a female protagonist wouldn't sell well. Yeah, really. How did they come to that conclusion exactly? Apparently, they focus tested the game with an all-male group. Yeah, they really should have done it with a much wider focus test group in mind. Anyways, getting back to Spy Fox, the only other unused elements are some instrumental renditions of the main theme and a few of the jukebox songs. Speaking of music, an interesting bit of trivia, both this game and Freddy Fish 5 double as soundtrack albums when you pop them in a CD music player. Pretty cool, huh? When the mission headed into space on March 30th, 2001, Spy Fox once more solved it with his usual brand of wit and suave. It spent four weeks in the top 10 selling home education software in May and June of that year and went on to sell 77,133 units, and critics were once more lauding it for being entertaining for both kids and adults, its humor, and for encouraging younger players to think more strategically. Following afterwards, there wouldn't be another entry in the series because, like I said in the Pajama Sam video, Infogrames didn't want to make any more of the adventure games and the series never received any console ports outside the PC and Mac, except for the ill-fated Wii port of Dry Serial. But it would find new life on Steam, the iOS, the Switch, and the App Store. Spy Fox would go on to win various awards over the course of its run, including a Best Pick Award, a Gold Honor Parents' Choice Award, an All-Star Award, and 20 Awards of Excellence. Spy Fox is the oldest skewing of the Big Four Junior Adventures for a good reason, with its exciting and engaging scenarios and gameplay, charming, witty, and memorable characters, and humor anyone of any age can enjoy. Up now, we'll be moving on from the world of espionage and have a more down-to-earth experience, as we'll be heading out to play some sports. When Spy Fox first hit the scenes in September of 1997, it went on to be another great success for Humongous. But it wouldn't be their only new series that took off. In fact, their next one would not only become their biggest series, but also the only one that continued on, mostly for worse, after the company dissolved. And that was Backyard Sports. As the name implies, it's a series of sports games, featuring a large cast of 30 kids, then later kid versions of various real athletes of their times. Whether it's baseball, soccer, football, basketball, or even skateboarding, the main goal of them is pure and simple. Get out there and have a real fun time playing the sports. Now for this video, things are going to be a little different. Since these games don't have a linear plotline, unless you count the season play, which even then is a stretch, this will be structured similar to the prologue, 
where it'll be a breakdown of the series history, but I'll still bring up some interesting tidbits. Anywho... The project first began in the mind of game designer and illustrator Nick Merkovich. As the oldest of five boys, he played all sorts of backyard sports growing up, in particular, wiffle ball. He also played various arcade sports games. One day, while on a drive from Olympia to Seattle, he got an idea about making a sports game for kids, which was fortuitous, given that, around the time, Electronic Arts began making it big with their EA Sports game series. The initial idea Murkovich had for it was largely inspired by and resembled the 1976 sports classic The Bad News Bears, where it would have involved controlling a team of neighborhood characters through a full season while also traversing a pre-planned antics-filled journey. Before he would pitch it though, Murkovich consulted with others at the company to help further sharpen his idea which ultimately led to its shifting to the more typical sports game structure of having a single game and season play options and concentrated the focus on the actual baseball game. Now, while the game completely deviated from Humongous' usual slate of point-and-click adventure games, it was still able to cater to the same kind of audience the aforementioned always went for. So, after that, he turned in his pitch to the higher-ups, and didn't hear anything back. In fact, it would sit on the shelf for at least six months. It probably would have been forgotten if it wasn't for one event that happened at that time. In 1995, the Seattle Mariners made it to the MLB playoffs for the first time in the team's history. So you can imagine, at the time, how huge of a deal this was. So, with all this baseball fever in the air, Ron Gilbert decided to greenlight the game. But by that point, Murkovich was busy working on another project, so the baseball game was given to two people, programmer Rich Moe and graphic designer Mark Pizer. However, Murkovich stuck around and supplied them with the athletic experience, since he was sharing the same office with them. With the duo assembled, the project got underway, but Mo and Pizer did have some concerns. For one, no one had checked to see if there was any market interest in a sports game for kids. And two, the tech the company had was built for point-and-click adventure games, not sports games. They also had concerns about how they were going to compete with EA Sports, as they were dominating the sports game market. So, after thinking it over, they ultimately decided they weren't going to try and compete with EA, and instead, take their game in a different direction than how the others were doing. Once they had that settled, the team had two goals for the game. Keep the gameplay as realistic as they can, and add as much whimsy as possible. However, not everything in the gameplay was fully realistic. The crew did add in fantastical elements to the game in the form of the power-ups, which were inspired by the ones in Mario Kart, which helped amp up the game's kid-friendliness. Now, a bit of trivia here. There were some other ideas for power-ups that didn't make it, including getting to swing with a tennis racket and placing a target in the outfield, which would have been worth 10 runs if it was hit. For the various fields, they did some tinkering in order to accommodate the variety of field surfaces and their quirks, like slowing down the kids' foot speed on sandy flats, and Tin Can Alley suppressing home runs. Of course, while the fields each possessed a personality, it wouldn't all be complete without the kids who were playing. As a standard baseball team usually consists of 9 players, the crew knew that they needed at least 18 but they also wanted to have alternate selections. After several discussions, they ultimately settled on developing 30 kids. For Pizer, this would be a major challenge. I mean, creating that large of a cast is just insane. 
So, for inspiration, Pizer and Moe turned to films and shows like Peanuts and The Sandlot to help capture the youthful tone the team was going for and how the former built their characters using mostly primitive shapes, while also keeping flourishes to a minimum. And the first one off the drawing board was Kimmy Ekman. As for their personalities, the team based them on themselves, people they knew, or other fictional characters. For example, Lisa Crockett was modeled after Daria, Pete Wheeler was inspired by Forrest Gump, and Ashley and Sidney Webber were based on Moe's wife and sister-in-law, as well as their love of tennis and the Williams sisters. These personalities would be reflected in their designs, their movements, and the music, as each one was given their own theme music. I'm gonna smack this one for sure. Sidney Webber steps up to the plate. This young brother means business. I'm gonna smash the ball out of here. Another specific goal the crew wanted to aim for was racial and gender diversity with half of the kids being girls, and the same for the ethnic ones too. The point of this goal was to make the game very approachable, so that any kid can look at any one of the kids and think to themselves, hey, that kid's sort of like me, or I know a kid just like that. One other way they deviated from the norm was by coloring the ethnic and African American kids as polychromatic. See. Pizer wasn't too keen on whenever an animated film or television show featured black kids, they'd all be depicted as having the same skin tone. So, he implemented shading variations, hoping that better reflecting the real world's spectrum of skin color would make the game more authentic, which it does. This desire for diversity didn't just apply to the players, it also did for the announcers and commentators. And out of that came Sunny Day. While Mo doesn't recall how or who came up with the idea for her, one thing was certain. Once it was brought up, it just stuck. It's also no coincidence that this was four years after Gail Gardner became the first ever woman to do Major League Baseball play-by-play, -play, and also probably served as an inspiration. Whoops. Let's Just like the main kids, the commentators had their own distinct personalities. Sunny Day herself was a know-it-all ahead of her years, and also helped that she was a real sports fan, while her partner in baseball, Vinny the Gooch, was meant to be like a young Howard Cosell. We look forward to this game as cold as it is. My colleagues are not as suitably garbed as I am. They are young. Wait a minute. The Gooch does not, under any circumstances, say hi ho. And belt it! Oh. Orange is good job. Better take a picture now, because this ball is out of here and it ain't coming back. The 40! The 30! The 20! The 10! The ball is over the line! Okay, we've now reached the point I'm sure you've all been waiting for. So, let's not dance around it any longer. Out of all the backyard gang members, there is one that stands out from the pack and would go on to become a fan favorite. And that was Pablo Sanchez. No matter which entry or version anyone played, it is almost universally guaranteed that players are going to pick Pablo as a part of their team. And for good reason. He is, no exaggeration, the best player of the whole bunch, simply for having the best stats of them all. It's kind of funny to think that this character was originally thought up as a gag. And yes, that is how the crew first conceived him. From his short stature and pop belly, his walk, to how his proportions are more cartoonish compared to the others, and the fact he's Mexican. From the offset looking in, Pablo looks like the last kid anybody would pick to be on a sports team, which was the whole point. How so? Well, 
It all goes back to the original inspiration for the game, the Bad News Bears. In the film, the main team roster had two out-of-shape Mexican boys who barely spoke English and had sparse appearances. Pizer thought, what if those two turned out to be the best players on the team and they never knew or didn't realize it? So that's what the team ran with, which really ended up being a stroke of genius, as it ended up making Pablo a compelling character. Also, the initial thought was that kids would at first ignore Pablo, but would then gradually discover his awesome talents. But there were two issues with this. By then, the creators decided to display the stats and skills for every player, which rendered the bit completely pointless, since just one look at his stats and players would immediately figure it out, not helping that his nickname was the Secret Weapon. Plus, even if they didn't pay attention, it would only take one turn at bat for players to see his true skills. Other aspects of Pablo's character were taken from some players on the Seattle Mariners, like his batting stance was a simplified take on Edgar Martinez's, and his Hispanic heritage was inspired by Alex Rodriguez. All of this can be reflected in his theme music. Pablo Sanchez stepped in. Even though the secret weapon doesn't speak any English, we all know he's a rad dude. Now, if there was one hiccup with the character, it was his voice. Since he was written to speak almost entirely in Spanish, it only made sense to have a Latino voice actor do the job. Unfortunately, the crew had no luck finding one, so they ended up going with Dex Manley, who had taken language classes in school. After going through the regular production cycle, the game was finished and ready to step up to the plate on October 10th, 1997. Interestingly, even though the series has been called Backyard Sports, it didn't start with that name right away. When it first began, the series was originally called the Junior Sports, obviously keeping it in line with the Junior Adventures and Junior Arcades. Then, beginning with Backyard Baseball 2001, the label was called Humongous Sports. It wouldn't be until around 2002 to 2003 was when it became its final title. Also, here's a little fun fact. Some of the players will have better or worse stats depending on if they're together on the same team. For example, if one puts Ashley and Sidney Webber on the same team, they will both have better stats, which is why the AI always tries to take one of them in the single game mode. But if you put Ronnie and Sally Dobbs together, they'll end up with worse stats. Although it would go on to become another popular series for Humongous, surprisingly, the original Backyard Baseball sold decently but overall, it underperformed in its first year. Now, this would be for two reasons. By that point, Humongous already had plenty of games out on store shelves, some of which have been out for months, and it was so new and very different from what they normally made, it was a bit harder to market. It could have been the end of the series right there, but fortunately, that would not be the case. Ron Gilbert told them they weren't going to give up on it until they had at least three games out on the market, which just showed how much Gilbert believed in it. Thus, they moved forward with the second game, Backyard Soccer, released on September 26, 1998. Remarkably, within a year, the series managed to find its footing. While critics criticized the game's controls and load times, they did praise its graphics on all platforms, and it went on to become a big hit. So, the next year, they came up with Backyard Football on September 14, 1999. This game is where two of the series' most notable aspects were introduced. The first was the Create a Player feature, which allowed one to custom make their own players. The other was being the first game to feature kid versions of real-life athletes. 
the latter would become the most divisive aspect for many. Some loved it for being able to play as their favorite athletes, while others weren't too fond of it, feeling that having them would take attention away from the main group, and also felt it took away what made the series stand out from the other sports games. But regardless of how people felt about it, for a very long time up until their licenses expired, it became a big mainstay of the series. After that came Backyard Baseball 2001, which went on to become another big success, then Backyard Basketball, and more kept on coming after that, with each one becoming a big hit. Between January of 2000 and August of 2006, the series had sold a combined total of 5.3 million units, and Humongous was topping the education software charts. Soon afterwards, they began porting them to other game consoles, with varying results. The series had become so huge, it surpassed other big franchises at the time, like Civilization, Roller Coaster Tycoon, and even EA's Madden series. The funniest and most ironic part about all of this success was, Ron Gilbert and Shelly Day didn't intend for Backyard Sports to outsell and overshadow the Junior Adventure games. On a side note, Humongous produced a TV special called NFL Football Basics, all about teaching, well, the basics of football, through a hybrid of live action and animation. This special marks the only time Humongous Entertainment ever successfully dove into the realm of television. For the crew that worked on it, the production was grueling, but it was also fun. Now, backing up a bit to the addition of the pro athletes, fascinatingly, the way the team integrated them in wasn't all willy-nilly. They had to carefully select which ones they were going to feature in the games, and the MLBPA never objected to any of their picks, which goes to show just how good Humongous' partnerships with every league was. When it came to designing their backyard counterparts, the Humongous crew had more creative freedom in that area compared to the others. In other sports game series, like Madden, the pros had to look exactly like how they are in real life. With Backyard Sports though, the team was able to take some of the pros' most identifiable traits and integrate them into the series' style. They also ensured that they looked like smaller versions of their adult selves rather than how they actually looked as kids. However, not every pro had a particular standout physical trait they could integrate. As for their skills, they tried not to make them too overwhelmingly popular compared to the Backyard game. One way they did so was by exaggerating some of the pros' weaknesses, like with Mark McGuire's slow running, or Randy Johnson being a poor hitter. Alright, getting back to the story, the game so impressed everyone that Humongous received a Kids' Choice Award nomination in 2002, and their partnerships were praised by the representatives of the major leagues. In fact, one of the series' biggest fans was Alex Rodriguez. So much so, that when he was asked to do an interview, he already knew a lot about the series. You know they made it big when one of the biggest baseball players of the time was a fan of their games. So, with the huge success the series was having and all of the recognition it was getting, what exactly happened that led to the series' downfall? Two big things, the massive company layoffs and budget cuts. While the games themselves were still continuing to sell very well, Humongous was financially hit hard. As a result, in an effort to lower costs, they began outsourcing the programming and some of the creative work. And this can be reflected in the finished game. Beginning with Backyard Hockey, the series was given a complete overhaul. They redesigned the main cast, changed the overall aesthetic, retired the treehouse menu in favor of a more standard looking one, and made other changes fans weren't too keen about. 
It didn't help either that the animation began to get buggy and the overall atmosphere grew more distant, resulting in the gameplay to suffer. Heck, the same can be applied for both Backyard Football and Basketball 2004. However, if you want ones that are clearer cost-saving examples, then look no further than Backyard Baseball 2003 and Backyard Soccer 2004. For these two, they just repurposed them from Backyard Baseball 2001 and the MLS edition of Backyard Soccer, with the only difference being they replaced the original Bad Animals cast with the Audio Gods cast, which in itself received mixed reactions from fans. That time again. Time for some non-stop baseball fun! This is Sunny Day, and my pal Vinny the Gooch with a hearty hi-ho to ya! We got all sorts of baseball fun for you today! Live from the Super Colossal Dome, this is Sunny Day and Vinny the Gooch, ready for another exciting game! Then, beginning with Backyard Baseball 2005, the series made the full switch over to CGI, thus making it the only humongous entertainment series to do so. In that same year, they also came up with a new sports game, Backyard Skateboarding, which, when it was first released, was notable for being full of bugs and glitches, some of which were fixed up in the Game of the Year edition. Also, they changed up the controls where now one had to use the mouse and keyboard simultaneously. But, despite all of the changes and the increasing mixed reception, the series kept on plugging along. That was until the release of Backyard Football 2006 on September 20th, 2005, which is sadly notable for being the very last game made by Humongous Entertainment before the company dissolved. From this point forward until 2013, Atari Inc. assumed full command over the series, and this is where things truly started to go downhill starting with Backyard Baseball 2007. What exactly happened? Well, first, they aged up the main gang to their teenage years, and then later on, gave them more realistic looks, which took away a lot of the series' relatability, uniqueness, and charm. Second, it was around this time that some of the original kids started getting cut from the rosters, which you can imagine really angered a lot of fans. Sure, they tried to introduce some new ones, but many of them weren't very well received, the most notorious of them all being Joey McAdoo. Also, production on the series was handed off to a variety of companies, and it became more and more evident that less care and effort was being put into them. So much so, that a lot of people were now viewing the series as nothing more than a cash cow. It didn't help either that critics were giving these later entries some very harsh reviews. They had gotten so bad, even many former Humongous employees hated them. Now, Atari Inc. did attempt to bring the series back to its early roots in 2010 with Sandlot Sluggers and Rookie Rush. However, the end result didn't go over so well. Sure, they no longer had the major sports league licenses, and there was more effort put into the voice acting, adding in new power-ups, giving the characters a more cartoony look, and even going as far as creating a prologue comic strip. But many of the problems people had with the later entries still persisted. The characters were still teens, with even more of the gang being removed to the point where now only 8 of the original 30 remained, and the controls were still as complicated as ever. Needless to say, they both ended up being big failures, and the series went into dormancy. In 2013, amidst their bankruptcy, Atari Inc. sold Backyard Sports to the Evergreen Group for their portfolio company, Epic Gear who then later sold it to Day6 Sports Group. Day6 tried their hands at reviving the series with the development of two new mobile games, Backyard Baseball and Basketball 2015, released on January 8th and February 6th, 2015 respectively. Unfortunately, 
Both games were panned harshly and were downloaded less than 5,000 times. Thus, the series once again fell dormant, and as of 2022, there hasn't been a new entry made. On a side note, when they announced the series was being revived, one former Humongous employee commented, and I quote, This just made me throw up at my mouth a little. Nice to see them flogging that dead horse. However, that's not the end of it. In 2016, it was reported that a film based on the games was being developed by Cross Creek Pictures and Crystal City Entertainment, with Ari Daniel Pincock and Brian Oliver as producers. No new updates have been made since March of that year, though the CCE executive Stuart Avi Savitsky says that it's currently in development and that they are actively working to move the project forward. Yeah, we'll see about that. Unfortunately, because of various licensing issues with some of the former pros, and other problems some of them had, it's very unlikely the older games will see any kind of re-release. Though, never say never. Most recently, there's an online fan project that came out called Backyard Sports Online, where it restored the online functionality of Backyard Football and Backyard Baseball 2001. Backyard Sports may have had a lot of ups and downs, but at its core, it did capture that nostalgic feeling of playing sports as a kid, which permeated the early titles and why they're fondly remembered to this day. With its large cast of fun and memorable characters, fun power-ups, and had an overall warmth and charm that just made you feel good playing them. For our final journey, we'll be leaving Earth and taking a little trip to the moon, as we'll uncover the story behind Humongous' most obscure and forgotten game. Our story winding down, as we've observed, Humongous Entertainment during its zenith had a great amount of highs. However, things started going wrong around the turn of the millennium. Its parent company, GT Interactive, amidst financial troubles, was purchased by the French-based Infogroms, and while they were still able to turn out good games in 2000 and 2001, there was a lot more executive interference, to the point where they weren't able to release new games into the market as much as they did before. First, there was the whole deal with the Gas Pocket Adventure, which got canned because the Infogrom's executives thought a game with a girl as the protagonist wouldn't have sold very well. And yes, it is still a stupid reason to cancel it. And... There is one game the company made that's so long fallen into obscurity, many people are unaware of its existence, and it perfectly exemplifies how bad Infogron's resistance and interference made everything. And that was Moonbase Commander. It's your basic top-down turn-based strategy game, where, on the moon, each player has a base which they can expand on by adding new buildings with specialized abilities, be they radar towers, energy collectors, or missile launchers, all of which are connected to a main base hub, which also has the ability to create new buildings via dotted power cables. The only catch though, is each hub has a limited number of cables, and they aren't allowed to overlap, thus requiring some care when it comes to their placement. The main goal of it is pretty simple, eradicate everyone else's bases before they eradicate yours, while also continuously defending and keeping yours functional. The last one still standing is the winner. Again, very simple and basic. Now, like with the Backyard Sports video, this'll just be going over the history of this game's production and what ultimately led to its failure. Anyways, on with the story.
The idea for the project was born in the mind of Rep Mathis, who began work on it in the fall of 1999, around the time GT Interactive was in the midst of its financial troubles. By giving great focus on the basic architecture, he coded the primary launching mechanics, user interface, and the camera navigation, all of which he did inside the scum, something very few thought could be achieved on the engine. By the time he completed it, Mathis had made enough progress. How much? Well enough to convince himself to continue forward on it. So, he next worked on the game's core units and the basic rules for the gameplay. He even took the time to paint the game's sprites and make them passably appealing. This also had the dual effect of making the game more readable and helped give it a stronger sense of identity. Even in its then current state, it was already looking and playing like a finished game. Within less than 6 months, Red had made a fully functioning vertical slice all on his own. The craziest thing about all of this is that, at the time Red was making it, he wasn't supposed to be. Oh, don't worry, he wasn't breaking any rules, it was just he was working on it during the holiday season, when most of his colleagues were off from work. That's how passionate he was about it. During its development, and just before GT was purchased by Infogroms, Rep was introduced to two other humongous colleagues, Chad Verrill and Darby McDevitt, both of whom were working on the Junior Sports Network at the time. After getting acquainted with the two, he asked them if they could play the latest version of his prototype, to which they said yes. So, he sends the link to them, and after 15 minutes of gameplay, Beryl and McDevitt weren't just impressed, they were completely hooked, to the point where they became the game's official testers. Not to mention, they all felt that this game could be the future of humongous entertainment. Over the next two months, they spent a good amount of each day playing the game and hammering out a new build, though at the cost of their regular office duties as well as report some new findings back to Mathis and discuss some of their impressions and concerns. After a few more months go by, it became clear for Red that his project, not his assigned work, was driving his passion. So much so that instead of giving in to pressure and refocus his attention as the lead programmer of one of Humongous' biggest franchises, he made a very bold decision. Rep was going to step down from his lead duties and continue on his personal project. But he also agreed to work full time on whatever other project he was assigned to by the HR department, specifically by programmer manager Betsy Warren. This was a risky gamble, since it was at the point Humongous was still transitioning to the new management. But fortunately, Warren was fine with his decision and assigned him to a new project under the guise of a new lead. Now with more time to give to the project, Mathis had one long-term vision for the game. Make it for an older audience. He felt Humongous was capable of making games that could appeal to a wider and broader audience, and saw Moonbase as the bridge that would transition the young fans of the Backyard Sports and Junior Adventures into more mature strategy games. This was also seen as the perfect opportunity for both the consumers and developers, since the morale and motivation of the latter had been on a decline for half a year by that point. However, later in August, there was a startling upset. Darby McDevitt, one of Red's biggest supporters and advocates of Moonbase, resigned from Humongous and took an associate producer job at a smaller company called No Wonder. However, before he left, during his resignation meeting, the HR rep asked if there was anything that would encourage him to stay at the company, and McDevitt asked for just one thing, a guarantee that Moonbase would get officially greenlit, be properly staffed, and released intact. If they did so, he'd be happy to stay and join the team. Unfortunately, that last bit didn't end up happening, because the rep then asked why he was leaving, and he said that he found another job at another game company. Thus, McDevitt left Humongous for good that afternoon. 
Not long after his departure, rumors about the game's quality started bouncing around the office space, and more and more employees got their hands on it, and it inevitably got the attention of one of the company's higher-ups. Come that autumn, and Andy Hayek, vice president of Humongous at the time, wrote a cordial email to Rhett about his project, which was a good sign, and after a few chats and email exchanges, Hayek suggests Rhett show it to a newly appointed producer, Jonathan Barron, who had been hired away from Electronic Arts. When they met in their first meeting, Mathis immediately took notice of Barron's passion and wisdom, which had an immediate effect on him. What also helped was that Baron was the first Infogrom's emissary to convince him that his heart was in the right place, and that he would assess the game's worth on its own merits, rather than basing it off of brand viability, assumed profitability, or market share. In fact, the only aspects Baron wanted to know were the basics. Was the game fun, and could it be sold to the right people? Another thing that came out of their first meet and greet was that John gave Rhett a full rundown on how to formulate a full pitch for the game. Over the next few weeks, Rhett learned all of the ins and outs of game development, and from there, he and John worked together on a comprehensive assessment of the project, and once they worked out one that was worth showing, they scheduled the pitch meeting. Now, this is where it starts to get a little complicated. When the day of the meeting came, with Baron by his side, Rhett gave a full rundown of the game's premise, its mechanics, strategic depth, and his hopes for its future. Once he finished, Andy questioned some of the various aspects. Why? Well, he didn't like Moonbase's setting and found the cartoony retro quiche of the Moonbase units to be cold and uninviting. Also, he wanted it to be more in line with Humongous's established catalog, a game that was warm and bright, inoffensive, and kid and parent approved. But he did recognize that Red did design an underlying game system of some merit, so he suggested it should have an alternate setting. And what was it he suggested? A garden theme, with the bases being flower patches and having the shields be domes of honey. As you can imagine, Red was very livid about the suggestions. Before Andy continued on, Red stood up and yelled, and I quote, Why a moon base? Because the moon is cool. Moon bases are cool. Spaceships are beepin' cool! That's why! After the conversation cooled down, much to Mathis' surprise, Andy gave him the thumbs up. It looked like things were starting to look up for the game. Jumping ahead to the spring of 2001, months before the big layoffs would hit, Rep was given the news that he would now be pitching his game to the CEO of Infogrom's, Bruno Bonnell, in Los Angeles. Rhett was terrified at the idea, but with John Barron continuing to back him, he was willing to give it a try. So, for a few days, they went over the format before Rhett thought up of a real winner. You see, Rhett wasn't satisfied with what he could demonstrate with just a PowerPoint presentation. So, he made the unusual choice of making a presentation inside the Moonbase engine as this would allow him to show segments of gameplay complete with overlays for key points, thus letting him do the pitch over the top of a live in-engine replay. It took a lot of work and Red had to work overtime, but it was all worth it, and even John was impressed with what he had done. Once they got it running smoothly, they set the date of the meeting for the last week of May. For Red, it was truly stressful. He had never been put in that kind of moment before, where all of his years of hard work were about to come down to a single meeting. On the day he arrived for said big meeting, Red noticed that all of the computers had spreadsheets and recognized several executives, and that's when he realized he had been invited to a budget session. Nevertheless, Red passed out the info sheets and proceeded to play the demo. 
at the end of the presentation, he opened the floor to questions, and Bruno piped in and asked, where's the strategy? Rhett was very incredulous by the comment. After all, everything about the game was right there in that demo, to the point where the strategic values were pretty self-evident. However, before he said anything, one executive from the then recently acquired Atari spoke up and said that there's something there, while another complimented the art and stated that it could practically be shipped as it is, which didn't sit well with Rhett. By the end, Bruno thanked him for his time and told him, we'll investigate further. After that, Rhett hopped the plane back to Seattle. Two weeks later, on June 13th, 82 humongous employees were laid off, thoroughly decimating employee confidence and bringing morale to its lowest point. But not all of it was bad news. A few days prior, Red had learned what Bruno's statement at the end of their meeting meant. They were going to do consumer marketing tests. This was great news, as it showed that Infogrames was willing to give Moonbase a fair chance. However, Red had some reservations about the process, as the first test for it was for a new humongous style adventure game character. This was far from ideal. Red had conceived Moonbase from day one as a game aimed for teens and adults, something that would grab the attention of booming gamers growing out of the junior adventure games and getting into more competitive games. However, the marketing team didn't provide that, and instead brought in the regular posse of 8 to 12 year olds, asked them about their gaming habits, and showed them a few slides of concept art. If the testing failed, that would have been the end of Moonbase. But even in lieu of that, Red still wanted Moonbase to succeed no matter what happened. Thus, on that testing day, Red went down to the monitoring room and witnessed that the testing was not going well. They didn't show a demo of the game itself, but rather asked them a set of questions illustrated with a few screenshots. And the kids were very bored. If anything, their responses right there would have ended it all for Moonbase. Fortunately though, marketing had a concession and made the bold and unusual choice to allow Red to guide the next round of tests himself. When he did so, he came prepared with another demo for these ones. Red personally led the kids through a specially prepared presentation, and afterwards, he got exactly the results he wanted. But marketing didn't get it. Miraculously though, Red's interference didn't completely invalidate the results. Someone had written up an encouraging report and forwarded that to another person, who in turn approved the money for a more proper product analysis, using an independent marketing company. This gave Rep more cause for worry though, as the response from that group suggested that Moonbase should be in the tween to teen group. At first, this seemed like a major victory, since Humongous had never targeted users that old before. Unfortunately, they ultimately decided that the tween audience would be the target range. This, of course, knocked Rhett's hopes down a few pegs. But even with that, one message was clear from the research group. They could sell it. Finally, after two years of jumping through hoops, Rhett at long last got the message he wanted to hear. Moonbase had been given the green light. However, someone in marketing suggested changing the title, and hence, Moonbase would become Moonbase Commander. Now, at this point, you may be thinking that the rest will all be smooth sailing from here. Oh ho ho, you'd be wrong! Things were about to get a lot more hectic. After finally greenlighting it, Infogrames wanted the game to be done on a budget of $300,000. For Rhett, this was disappointing, as it signified a lack of commitment from Infogrames. But 
always the fighter, Rip fought back and directly told Andy that it was going to cost at least twice as much. To which he replied that it wasn't something he needed to think about in the moment. But Andy was open to some level of leeway. So the two struck a deal, and once he assembled the team, the full production got going in the fall of 2001. For the actual production, it was dense, intense, efficient, and rapid as the game had to be done in just a few months with a small team, consisting of Pat Wiley, who managed the production and kept things moving along, Brad B. Taylor, who optimized Scum's sprite renderer to accommodate the quasi-3D look, engineer Daryl Milner, who handled the enemy AI, artist Cisco Martinez, who updated the look and feel of Brett's original art, and handed it over to texture artists Mark Wattenbeck and modelers Dan Cole and Jim Miller once they were approved, Kristen Heavenstreet and Ben Young who refactored the UI and menus and the testing team, Pat Hoynes, Steve Kuo, Jeff McCrory, Robert Oakes, and Chad Verrill, who contributed to the game's multiplayer maps. Lastly, though only for a short time, Brad Carlton came on board as a writer and added personality to the four warring factions. Work continued through the winter and into the spring of 2002 at a pace that everyone, even Red, was impressed with. Around this point, Infogrames announced they were aiming the game for a summer release of that year. Rep was grateful for the apparent support and confidence as this would also give Humongous a chance to present the game to the press at E3 in June of that year. However, before all of that, backing up a bit to late April, one of Humongous' top executives called all of the senior leads down for an impromptu pep talk. He wanted to show them a game he thought could signal the future of the company, a sort of signpost for what they could do. When everyone was present and seated, the executive pointed up to the screen and said to them, This is what we want from the company. This is the sort of thing Humongous should be making. What game was he showing them? Oh, just a little unknown commodity you've probably heard of called Kingdom Hearts. After the opening movie, there was nothing but silence. Now, the crew didn't think the game wasn't exciting or felt they had the talent to do a game like that. Quite the contrary. It was just, at that point, Humongous, in its current state, was financially incapable of making one like that. So, what was intended to rally up the company's morale and spirit, ended up making the crew sputter and fume more, and created a sense of hopelessness. But, that didn't stop Rhett, as he and the team continued their work on Moonbase Commander. Okay, getting back to the E3 announcement, the timing of the E3 Expo couldn't have been more perfect. The popularity of sci-fi themed strategy games were at an all-time high, so Moonbase Commander seemed poised to make a big splash. Plus, with it nearly being finished, it didn't need a demo or special presentation. All they needed was to get a few dozen journalists to play it for just 15 minutes, and there would be no question they'd found their audience. But there was one big thing holding it back. Infogrames themselves. When Wreck got a look at a draft of the final E3 presentation, Moonbase Commander wasn't on it. The message he got from that was as clear as day. Infogrames had no idea what to do with the game, or didn't plan to do anything with it at all. So, like many times before in this story, Rhett took things into his own hands and contacted Pat Hoynes, who had been tasked to demo their upcoming titles at E3, gave him a copy of Moonbase, and asked him to do one simple task. Show the game to anyone he could. Unfortunately, Pat's duties at the booth kept him occupied for much of the event until the third day when he managed to get Penny Arcade's Tycho and gave him a quick preview. After playing a couple of matches, Tycho left impressed. Pat shared this story with Rhett 
and he was touched, as this was the first time someone outside Humongous was able to play it. However, that wasn't enough of a push to help out Moonbase Commander. As the game approached its release date, there were clear signs that Infogrames had zero interest in the game. The marketing team wasn't interested in getting a clear message out to the right people, as the initial box art and text were designed for third graders and ads were planned for parenting magazines. The team tried to appeal to marketing on how far they were missing the point, but they weren't going to change their campaign. They did, however, let Red change the box art after several emails and arguments but they remain steadfast on aiming the game at 8 to 12 year olds. None of that mattered though, as in the final month prior to the release, the marketing push was so minuscule, it was essentially non-existent. And when the game finally landed on the moon on August 13th, 2002, there would be no buzz or press coverage for it. Thanks to the minuscule marketing and lack of push, Almost nobody knew about it, and it inevitably failed big time, only having a market value between zero and $100,000. On the bright side though, critics gave the game great reviews, praising the gameplay, its ability to really encourage strategic thinking, and for being just overall exciting and engaging. The game would win some awards including Best Budget Game from Computer Game Magazine, and won both IGN's and GameSpot's award for Best Game No One Played. Despite its unjustifiable failure, Moonbase Commander would get a second chance at life, as there would be downloadable copies for sale on Atari's official website. Later on, the game was sold off to Rebellion Developments, and then eventually re-released on Steam in 2014 in its complete unabridged form, with the full original gameplay, single player campaigns, and local multiplayer. Moonbase Commander is the most unique entry of Humongous Entertainment's library, as it showed that the company was capable of making games for an older audience, and is a prime example of how disinterest from the higher routes can ruin a game's chance of success. But it currently lives on, finding a new audience and becoming a cult favorite. The time has now come for the honorable mention. So, what did I have in mind for Humongous Entertainment? Well, I originally thought about spotlighting the composers, as I've only mentioned one of them, George Sanger, in the Pup Pup video. However, that wasn't special enough for this. Then, after some careful thinking, a very simple idea struck me. To spotlight not just the composers, but also everyone else who helped bring the games to life. So, that's what we'll be doing. To close out this retrospective, let's give the spotlight over to the composers, the cast, and the crew. Now, the way this will go down is like this. For the composers, we'll start off with the lesser ones, then move up to the more well-known names, while also giving highlights of each of their respective works. As for the cast and crew members, since there were a lot of people that put a lot of work into the games, we will be spotlighting the most notable members of each. So, with all of that out of the way, it's time to get this thing started. Now, what better place to start at than with the ones that started it all? First up, we have Tom McMail who composed the music for Pup Pup Joins the Parade and Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise, and they would be the only games he'd do for Humongous. Just a quick heads up, this first one's gonna be rather short. Oh, there are some aspects worth talking about. It's just, the two soundtracks are rather similar and there's not enough to talk about each individually. 
so I'll talk about both of them together. Anyways, McNeil did a great job at giving both games that cute, whimsical, and fun vibe they were going for. However, even with that, they do have different tones that make them stand apart from one another. Pup Putt's score is brighter, cheerful, and upbeat, which suits it well given it's about entering a parade, while Fatty Bear's is more downbeat and quiet, fitting well with the nighttime setting, and it does a great job at capturing the feeling of said setting. There's the measuring cup. I can measure things for the cake in this. I found the letter P. Overall, McMahon did a great job with Putt-Putt and Fatty Bear soundtracks, making them stand apart from one another. It's a real shame he didn't continue to do more music for Humongous. It would have been interesting to see what else he would have brought to the table. Next up, we have Nathan Rosenberg of the Doghouse NYC, and by no coincidence, we're jumping from the first games all the way to the last ones. And that's no joke, Rosenberg composed the music for Freddy Fish 5 and Pajama Sam 4, and right off the bat, there's a lot more to talk about with these ones. To start with, he did an amazing job with Freddy Fish 5 soundtrack capturing a wide range of tones and moods depending on what the scene calls for. From the peppy, fun, and upbeat tunes when one is traveling in and out of town and parts of Coral Cove Park, the appropriately fitting militaristic sounds of Marge's bass, to the sci-fi vibe of Casey's lab, the jazzy vibe of Nick's Snacks, the sophisticated feel of the mayor's office and Clyde's barbershop, and the mysterious and unsettling feelings of the shipwreck, the first hub of the park, and especially the Jawfish Hole, Tetra Cave, the Crevice, and Marty's House. To conclude, Rosenberg really knocked it out of the park with the soundtrack, and it was a good one for the series to go out with, even if it wasn't planned to be the final game of the series. As for Pajama Sam 4's, for all of the game's faults, its score was certainly one of the better aspects. It does a fairly good job at conveying the whimsical, upbeat, weird, and otherworldly vibe while also including a sort of jazzy blues feel. Many of the cues work well in invoking the mood of each area, like with the gum cave or the chest bleachers, and it can sometimes get a bit engaging. However, there are some cues, mostly at the beginning, that do sound a bit on the melodramatic side. Also, the Sox's musical number, while not bad on its own, feels very out of place, and just seems rather pointless to have one when there aren't any other numbers in the entire game. Though there was going to be a reprise of it for the two Sox reunion. And the trading cards queue, while pretty decent, can get very tiresome since it plays every time the player collects a card.
Overall, Pajama Sam 4's soundtrack could have been better, but it's certainly far from being the worst soundtrack in the world. Next, we're actually going to be sticking with the Doghouse NYC for just a little bit longer. Yeah, it wasn't just Nathan Rosenberg that worked with Humongous. The company was primarily responsible for doing the music for many of the later Backyard Sports games, and they work fine for each respective entries, but they don't have the same fun energy of the earlier ones, and just comes off like your average sports game soundtrack. That being said though, this is not to say that they're all bad. On the contrary, there are a few cues that do stand out, including but not limited to... On the whole, the Doghouse NYC did a rather decent job with Backyard Sports, but they could have done so much more and better with them. Oh, and while we're still on about Backyard Sports, up now we have Rhett Mathis. He did the scores for many of the early entries, including the original theme music for all 30 kids, the Hall of Fame, and the menu and they work great at capturing the character's personalities, the fun and upbeat tone, and especially the sports atmosphere. The only other game outside of Backyard Sports that he did the music for was Puppa and Pep's Balloonorama, and he actually did a good job with it. It really works in making it feel fun, bright, upbeat, and, no pun intended, bouncy. So, to no one's surprise, Mathis did a great job here, and it truly showcased just how talented he was, more of which we'll get into later. Up next, we have Scott Lloyd Shelley. He did the music for the two Big Thinkers games, as well as Spy Fox Hold the Mustard, Putt Putt Joins the Circus, and Pajama Sam Games to Play on Any Day. Shelly did a great job at both giving and capturing the individual tone of each respective games. From the cheerful and bright and bubbly vibe of Big Thinkers, the espionage and adventurous excitement for Spy Fox, to getting the circus atmosphere, characters, and the bouncy upbeat tone of Putt Putt, and the calm and laid back jazzy feel of Pajama Sam despite the latter just reusing the soundtrack from Pajama Sam 3. All in all, just as everyone before him has done, 
Shelly's pieces work very well in invoking the feel of each game's distinctive worlds and areas. Alright, now we're getting into the more well-known composers. Up now is Thomas McGurk. By far, out of all the composers, he contributed to the most games in Humongous' catalog, and he did an incredible job doing so. From bringing a perky and musical feeling to Freddy Fish 2, the tropical and bright sunny vibe of 3, the western setting of 4, going with a more casual country feel for Puppa Enters the Race, to a few cues from some of the backyard sports games, and along with Jeff Kirk, getting the quirky, exciting, and fun-filled mission feel in Spy Fox 2 and 3. To conclude, McGurk did a great job in getting the mood of each adventure and making the games feel much more engaging. Again, it's amazing he did the music for so many games and was able to deliver a different feel for each. Next, we've got Julian Soul. He truly knocked it out of the park with his music, nailing the Bond-inspired style for Spy Fox the industrial and work environment feel of Pajama Sam 2, and how he was able to work in previous queues for two of the one-stop fun shops and Pajama Sam's Lost and Found, as well as the new compositions done for the latter. Overall, Julian did a great job in creating some of the more memorable cues and infusing the fun and peppy mood into his music. Well, speak of the devil, up next we have Julian's brother Jeremy. He too did a great job with many of the compositions he did. The fun and various vibes of the stages of Dog on a Stick, Maze Madness, Water Worries, Sockworks and Lost and Found along with Julian, the dark, gloomy, and somewhat unsettling mood of Pajama Sam 1, and getting the various vibes of each time periods and sense of wonder for Papa Travels Through Time. All in all, like Julian, Jeremy did a great job in getting the fun and peppy feel, and again, that sense of wonder, while also bringing his own spin to the games. <laughs> Last, but certainly not least, we have the fat man himself, George Alistair Sanger. He helped set the standard for the music which the other games would follow suit. From setting the upbeat and otherworldly feel in Puck Puck Goes to the Moon, the sense of urgency and foreboding feeling in Freddy Fish 1, the various themes for each area of the zoo in Puck Puck Saves the Zoo, literally doing the theme for the junior field trips, nailing the moon for the Isle of Mop Top in Pajama Sam 3, and performing the invitation song in Pep's birthday surprise.
All told, Sanger did a superb job, as did every composer, as I've continually been saying. They each brought something unique to the table with each game, and helped to make them stand out just as much as the characters and the adventures did. Of course, the music is only one component in making the games work. There's also the voices that help bring the characters to life. First one up is Ken Boynton. He was one of the most versatile actors Humongous had with them, as he played a wide variety of side characters in many of their games, including... Be sure to check out the Spy Vending Machine too, Spy Fox. I've stocked it with a plethora of useful gadgets. Pardon me, sir, but just where do you think you're going? On board? Sir, you are obviously making little jokes. Step right up, guild and buoys, for the most amazing carnival under the sea. You remember the terrific tumble to ride last year? Well, what we've got in store for you this year is even better. Flaky, or I mean, Inspector, it's nice to see you. Employee of the month? <laughs> Like me. They really like me. Up next is Gina Neji, aka Anita Montgomery. She was primarily the voice of Monkey Penny for all of the Spy Fox games. The only other character she voiced was Poodles Galore in Operation Ozone. However, even with only two characters, Neji did a great job with them, bringing a confidence and know how to Monkey Penny and the sophisticated, but also wild and crazy energy for Poodles Galore. We believe Plato Pushpin, the cosmetic rocket scientist, has been abducted by Poodles Galore. He's the only person with the knowledge to stop this orbiting aerosol can. I was destined to be the reigning baroness of beauty. Even as a child, I knew how to accessorize. Next, we have Mike Shapiro. He did only four characters for Humongous. Ben Brightly in Big Thinkers, Merlin the Magician in Putt Putt Travels Through Time, Johnny Gecko in Spy Fox and Dry Cereal, and Andrew Glimmer in Pajama Sam 2. Even with a small pool, he is quite a talented actor, as he's got plenty of range with the various characters he did. Some nouns and verbs are missing from this story. Help me pick some new ones. Hmm. Huh. Well, everything appears to be in order. I guess I'll have to give you a rubber band. Do, do not tell me. Ah, yes. You must be from the future. No, no, no. Thank you, Mr. Too Cool for a Foxy White Suit Jacket Guy. You are beautiful, baby. Don't go changing. Ah. Up now, we have Kathy Levin. She was the first voice of Sam's mom in the first game, as well as one of the snooty trees. However, her best known voice for many fans is that of Bee Bear in the Spy Fox series. She also did Mata Harry, Dottie Dash, Agent Gracefully, Trudy Fruit, and Pins. I tell you, kiddo, I did the single snow boot as the masked she bear. It goes like this. The strong, fat boy. I've been on surveillance here in WeWorld, searching the airwaves for anything suspicious. I intercepted a smelly message that has to do with some activation code. Try not to say my name too often. I'm trying to travel incognito. I'm Trudy Fruit. I'm here studying Chickle for my PhD in gamatology. Good luck, Spy Fox. I'm out of here. <laughs> Plan B. Next, we have David Scully. He provided several voices for the Spy Fox games. Captain Drydock, Gilbert and Mr. Waltz in Dry Cereal, Napoleon LaRoche in Some Assembly Required, King Conglomerate in Hold the Mustard, and Bobby Lama in Operation Ozone. However, he is probably best known as the voice of Carrot in the Pajama Sam games, 
as well as darkness. Because back there is the sea, the final frontier. And my voyagers on the SS Winterprise, on a 25-year mission to seek out new sea life and new civilizations, I boldly went where no raccoon has gone before. So Spycore has sent the famous Spy Fox to try and stop my plans for world domination. This mask belongs to the people. I've got to stay here and keep the general from declaring war. So somebody needs to find the other four delegates and get them here. They must have run into trouble, or they'd be here by now. You're scared. I'm the one who's going to be stuck in the box. Oh dear. No one ever wants to come over and play fun games with me. Now, we've got Scott Burns. Hoo boy, if you thought Ken Boynton was versatile, Burns takes the cake. He was essentially the male blank of the group, because he did a lot of the male side characters in nearly every game. Which characters did he voice? There's a lot of work to do before Kayla wakes up. I want to make her a big, beautiful birthday cake. Oh, will she ever be surprised. I've been meaning to get that recycled. Say, Putt-Putt, if you wouldn't mind, could you take it to be recycled for me? I'm a great Putt-Putt. Hey, uh, Pot Pot, I'm uh, getting a little low on produce. How'd you like to do me a favor and go out on the farm and pick me up some more, huh? It's my wacky cat, Bonzo. He ran down this bowl, I mean this hole, and now he won't come out from under the house. Are you kidding? I owe you. I mean, you're the guy who brought me back from the moon. I was just putting the finishing touches on my time portal. <laughs> no one gets past Eddie the Eel. <laughs> Well, it all started as a typical day at the office. When you're as important as I am, you're constantly fielding international cattle calls and reviewing grazing reports. You need Russian blue followed? I'm your bug. I'm on her like fleas on a dog. Or a cat, as it were. It's me, Mickey Hollandays, top banana for all your comedy needs. May I have the spotlight, please? And those are just some of the notable ones. Okay, now we're getting into the title characters. First one up is Bob Zank. He was the first voice of Spy Fox for Dry Cereal and Cheese Chase. But that's not all. He also did Outback Owl, The Toll Bridge, Burnt the Pencil, and Mr. Crankcase. Jackaroo, you're on! Of course, we can't open the zoo until they're all rescued, so I'm counting on you, Putt-Putt. So what do you think of Skycorp's new Greek Island Mobile Command Center? Impressive. Disguising it as a half-buried boat in the middle of the town square was a stroke of genius. Nobody would ever notice that. However, he wasn't the only one to voice Spy Fox. Which brings us to Mike Mattioy. Now, to briefly recap, Bob Zank moved out to Hawaii when some assembly required was in production. And since at the time it was near impossible to record remotely, they had Matty Oi take over the voice. And he did a great job doing so. Also, he voiced the Y Pipe in Pajama Sam 2 and Sheriff Shrimp in Freddy Fish 4. I don't normally look in other people's medicine cabinets, but I am a spy after all, and I'm on a mission. Time to go back to work. Do I have to? Of course you do. Why? Sheriff Zachariah Shrimp is in your debt. If there's ever anything you need, why, you just ask. Up now, we have Jason Ellison. He was mainly the first voice of Pup Pup for the first four adventure games and the two junior arcade titles. The only other notable character he voiced was Jason at the start of Freddy Fish 1. Oh my, it's a marching band. Right now we're a sitting band. Yeah, how can we march without any music? I think I can help you. Uh, beep, beep yourself. Hot ziggity! Is this ever going to be fun? Excuse me, I'm Putt-Putt. I'm visiting from the past. I thought this was a library. Where's all your books? Unfortunately, change would inevitably be afoot. Enter veteran voice actress Nancy Cartwright. 
Elbson was beginning to hit puberty when he was doing Travels Through Time. Thus, his voice was no longer a good fit for the character, so they brought on Cartwright to take over the voice, and she did a pretty decent job playing the character. Oh, the Speedway drivers sing this song, zoom zoom, zoom zoom, Speedway track is five miles long, zoom around all day, hey! Here, goaty goaty, here, goat. That did the trick. Well, thanks, partner. Next up is Annette Tutongi. She did the voice of Freddy Fish, and was the only voice actor to hold on to the title role for all of the games in the series. She was also Sprinkles and the librarian in Pajama Sam 3. We need to find Grandma Grouper's treasure chest because that's where the kelp seeds are. If we don't find them soon, all the fish are going to die. Whoop! Oh my! It's a good thing I can float. Just have the book back in three weeks! Now, we've got Mike McGolliff. He was the voice of Luther for all of the Freddy Fish games, and, like Annette, held on to the character for the whole run. His only other notable voice was one of the aliens in Puck Puck Goes to the Moon. Let's go get Grandma Grouper's kelp seeds! Hot dog, I'm gonna be rich! I'll try this again! Victory! Game over. You won all five glowing moon crystals. Up next, we have Pamela Adlon. She was the voice of Pajama Sam for the first three adventures, the Junior Arcades, and games to play on any day. And she is especially notable for being the first big name voice actor in the humongous cast. This is a job for... Pajama Sam! Did you want to suggest a new type of weather? Um, what about room temperature snow for the summer? Oh, we've already got that. It's called mud. I never thought of that. That ought to just about do it. Thanks for all your help, Sam. Hey, what do you say? Shall we fire it up? I'll let you do the honors. Sure! But she wasn't always fully available. Which brings us to E.G. Daly. Because Adlin was busy doing other projects at the time Sockworks was being made, Daly was brought on to play Sam and she did a good job at replicating the raspiness and little boy quirks Adlin brought to the character. <sighs> uh, oops, I guess I must have fallen asleep. That was a great dream. But I better get to work on those socks now. Mom said to have them done before school. Next, we have Alicia Ferguson and Michelle Thorson. For those that don't know, because of Humongous' financial struggles and the fact Pajama Sam 4 and Pep's birthday surprise had lower budgets, they couldn't afford to have either Carpright nor Adlin to reprise their respective roles. So Ferguson took over Sam while Thorson did Putt-Putt. And to repeat what I said in those videos, I'm certain they both tried their best, but the final results were not very good. Wow, what a great idea! And how about we throw him a surprise party? Pep loves surprises. Now do you understand my position? I think so. You're sad because you can't be together with the other blue sock, because you're dirty and the other one's clean. Lastly, we've got the Bad Animals cast of Backyard Sports, including Jen Taylor as Sunny Day, Billie Jean Blackwood, Luelle Louis, and Maria Luna, Dolores Rogers as Vinnie the Gooch, Earl Grey and Ernie Steele, Dex Manley as Pablo Sanchez, Ricky Johnson and Barry DeJ, Kiamelise Budok as Sally Dobbs and Vicky Kawaguchi, Kathy Faulkner as Ashley and Sidney Weber, 
Mary Jo O'Donnell as Jocinda Smith and Keisha Phillips, Sally Lindbergh as Dmitry Petrovich, Lisa Crockett, Mikey Thomas, Stephanie Morgan, and Tony Del Vecchio, Nick Austria as Marky Dubois, Kathy Hanson Garrick as Dante Robinson and Ronnie Dobbs, Mark Lund as Ahmed and Amir Khan and Jorge Garcia, Shelley Reynolds as Pete Wheeler, and Corey Shenango as Angela Del Vecchio, Annie Fraser, Gretchen Hasselhoff, Kenny Kawaguchi, Kimi Ekman, and Reese Worthington. Me gusta el baseball más que la tarea de la escuela. Vamos a jugar. I'm the only girl in my family. I've got four brothers and they all love sports, so I grew up around baseball and basketball, so I know the rules pretty good. I'm in the third grade, but I tested into the fifth grade, but my pop, he wouldn't let me move up because he didn't want me to make my brother Tony feel like a knucklehead. He says, Angela Sugar, you're a good kid. What you need to go making your brother Tony feel like a knucklehead? And then I says, hey pop, don't sweat it, you know? And he says, here. My mama says, I got a bottomless stomach and a hollow leg. Now, I don't know much about anatomy because I'm just a kid, but that doesn't sound right. But whenever I ask my doctor about it, she just laughs. So do me a favor. The next time you go to your doctor, ask if it's possible for a kid to have a bottomless stomach or a hollow leg. Because I got a feeling I'm the victim of some kind of conspiracy or something. Overall, Every voice actor did an amazing job at bringing the respective characters to life and giving them distinctive quirks, qualities, and personalities. That there is something truly admirable and awesome. The cast and the music can certainly make or break a game, but all of that would be nothing without the crew that helped put all of the games together. Of course, we have to start off with the people that first got the ball rolling, Ron Gilbert and Shelly Day. They weren't just running the company and getting all the necessities, like securing funding and getting the license to the Scum Engine from LucasArts, they were also contributing ideas including Gilbert helping out with the story for Freddy Fish 1 and coming up with the initial concept that would become Pajama Sam, while Day created Pup Pup from a series of bedtime stories she thought up. But they weren't alone on this. There's also Brad Carlton. He first originated the character of Freddy Fish in a comic strip he drew up, and along with the late Brett Barrett, thought up the idea that became Spy Fox. He was also one of the few members from the very beginning that knew how to do hand-drawn animation. Then we have Nick Merkovich. He thought up and laid out the entire concept for the backyard sports games, as well as supplied the needed athletic experience. There's also Rich Moll and Mark Pizer, who on top of being a programmer and graphic artist and animator respectively, were handed the Backyard Baseball project when Markovich was busy working on another game, and they came up with the original 30 Backyard Kids, adding in the fantasy element with the power-ups, and deciding to present a diverse cast of kids. Pablo Sanchez stepped in. Even though the secret weapon doesn't speak any English, we all know he's a rad dude. Up next, we have Tammy Borowick. In addition to being a programmer and designer, she was the one who advocated to change Freddy from a boy to a girl, and acted as the first game's general manager and project leader for Freddy Fish 2 and 3. Oh! 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 I'm giving it all I got, Captain! You boys will be wanting the accommodation to the trophy case. Excuse me, sir, but I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. Now, we come back to Rhett Mathis. Yep, in addition to being a composer, he was a sound effects programmer, interactive designer, and wrote the dialogue for Balloonorama, Maze Madness, and the commentary play-by-play -play for Backyard Soccer and its MLS edition. 
However, his biggest achievement at the company was creating and developing the strategy-based cult classic Moonbase Commander, as well as doing the audio for the special effects. Up now is Rafael Calonzo Jr. He had worked on the art and animation for the Junior Field Trips, four of the Pup Puck games, nearly all of the Pajama Sam games, and was a lead designer, did the game design for, and was interactive game designer for several of the Backyard Sports games. But most important of all, he was the one who came up with Pajama Sam's name back when he was still called Pumpkinhead Boy. His interests include skydiving, channeling ancient spirits, and stamp collecting. I don't collect stamps. You're making that up. Takes a pump chat, tries to knock the puck away. Takes a stab at the puck. What a chest by Buddy Chuck. Up now is Brett Barrett. On top of co-creating Spy Fox, he was primarily the programmer for many of Humongous' early titles, and also worked as the interactive designer for Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo and Putt-Putt Travels Through Time. <sighs> Thanks a ton, Putt-Putt. Now I can go home to my pop. Don't mention it. Welcome to our museum. I am Arthur T. Fact, the pre-programmed curator. But you may call me R.T. Fact. The laser toothbrush makes impervious steel doors pervious. Next is Tom Vary. He first worked on the digital ink and paint for Freddy Fish 1, was an animator for Let's Explore the Airport, Spy Fox and Dry Serial, as well as being a storyboard artist on that and Pajama Sam 1, did the computer art and animation for Putt Putt Saves the Zoo and Blue's Birthday Adventure, wrote Spy Fox 2, and was a character designer on Pajama Sam 3. <laughs> Yum! Grandma Grouper's famous peanut butter and jellyfish sandwich. I guess I could let you get past. Good luck finding Grandma Grouper's kelp treasure. Now up is Lee Vary. She began by doing the digital ink and paint for Putt Putt Saves the Zoo, then was a clip point artist on Dry Cereal, did the computer art and animation for Blue's birthday adventure along with Tom, and was the one that performed the Poodle Menace on the Spy Fox 3 soundtrack. Spy Fox. He lives his life where danger dwells. He spends his days in peril. Spy Fox. He gets the clues that solve the crimes. He always helps his fellow man. Next up, we got Ron Goodfellow. He was responsible for doing much of the package illustrations and also some of the manuals and activity books, was the lead graphic designer on Freddy Fish, served as illustrator on Spy Fox 3 and Freddy Fish 5, the 2D animation for Backyard Hockey, storyboarded the credit sequence for the 2003 edition of Backyard Baseball, and did the background layout and paintings for Pep's Birthday Surprise and Pajama Sam 4. You got the 20 clams you owe me, Gil? Uh, not exactly. A magnet might be useful. How much is it? It's free. Consider it my gift to you for helping fix my sign. Hey! You there! With the prickly pear! Prickly pear? What prickly pear? The x-ray machine shows that you have a prickly pear. Now all prickly pears stay in the prickly pear ranch. Those are the rules. Next is Brad Taylor. 
He served as the systems programmer for almost all of Humongous' games and did the interactive design for Spy Fox and Cheese Chase and Pajama Sam's Lost and Found. Next up is Chad Verrill. He did the Junior Sports Network testing for the first Backyard Football, the online Q&A testing on Backyard Baseball 2001, worked on the online team for Backyard Basketball, assistant designer online for Backyard Football 2002, and served as one of the testers on Moonbase Commander. Oh, hey. Whoa! Looks like the offense just used a devastating sonic boom play to knock the defense flat! The 40! The 30! The 20! The 10! The ball is over the line! Up now, we've got David Galloway. He was the senior programmer for most of the Backyard Sports games from 2001 to 2004, served on the online team of Backyard Basketball, and was the systems programmer for Moonbase Commander. Last, but definitely not least, we've got Scott Whalen. He served as the Vice President of Online Game Development for both Humongous and Cave Dog Entertainment. All in all, Everybody from programmers, writers, background artists, storyboarders, animators, ink and painters, and testers played an important role in shaping how the finished games turned out and that it's making them fun and entertaining that comes first. Humongous Entertainment was truly a company that came in at the right place at the right time. They brought something special to the table that few other kids game companies did. Create fun and entertaining adventure games with simple but fun stories that had some level of challenge to the puzzles, humor that even adults can get into, memorable characters, and most importantly, they respected their audience's intelligence while also making them feel they can accomplish about anything when they set their minds to it. In essence, they followed the same mindset that worked for Disney for many years and made them endearing to this very day. Even 30 years on, they're still as fun and entertaining as when they were first released. To quote their early slogan, they made software that doesn't underestimate your child. So. To all of the people of Humongous Entertainment that helped bring the games and the characters to life, from the bottom of everybody's hearts, we thank you for creating and giving us an unforgettable experience. I hope you all enjoyed this incredible journey into the history and the various worlds of Humongous Entertainment. Thank you.